Because I realized that even by as simple as naming a thing, I actually robbed it of its essence. The minute we've decided <laughs> we've judged it, we've lost the plot. Judgment is the yes. closure wow. on the act of consideration because you've decided there's enough data, I'm done. I think the minute we jump on the judgment bandwagon, we've lost our credibility. The reason why I didn't love myself is I chose to stop loving myself. I'm telling you that you guys are bringing light to a thing that is in desperate need of attention and we should be prosecuting it. If you've chosen to let somebody else define for you what living is, you've already made your choice. Fact is you just show up, you be you, and it turns out that genuine recognizes genuine. Real is real, genuine is genuine, authentic is authentic, and anything that isn't, it's not a gray scale. Real is, and then everything else isn't. Honor and respect the thing, even if it's the thing that you perceive to be your enemy. I think we all need to enter into a space where we can actually suspend our judgment and get discernment instead, which is really fun because once you know that you've cracked open the possibility that all the stories are false, then everything can be re-examined. The phase of life I'm in right now is to make sure other people have the bridge to actually reawaken their memory of their possibility. been a wild week it has been and uh we're gonna get into the intro of who you are how you show up in the world and what's really important to you and the work you're doing but uh it's amazing to have you here today i f love your work thank you and um i love the way you show up and it's just it's with deep gratitude um that that I get to share today with you and really excited for what we're going to share with the the audience you take a, a much different approach to some of the tyranny in the world you go deeper into um, what causes it and, yeah. and rather than just blaming which is uh is is uh is uncommon so we're gonna get into that but it is my, my, my deep pleasure to introduce Dr. David E. Martin to The Great Unlearn and um, would love for him to just share a little bit about, like I said, his background, who he is, and uh, why he's here today. Yeah, so first of all, Cal, thank you. I mean, I love, I love conversations like this. I love when we're invited to go into a, an exploration, not only of what's going on, but, but the who. Mm -hmm. And then more importantly, what is that? energy that we all custodian or steward and and what is it that makes us tick so you know the what i do is actually evidenced by the footprints i've made around the world um i see a world that is beautiful and like the uh, beautiful line out of murder on the orient express when uh, inspector pro is asked how is it that you solve crimes and his response is beautiful. His, his response is, I, I see the world as it should be. And then what's out of place sticks out like a nose on a face. Uh, nice. <laughs> and, and so, you know, what I, what I love about my life is okay. I have been fortunate to seriously travel the world. I have baptized my body in all of the named oceans on this planet. Last time, buck naked, jumping in the Antarctic Circle. <laughs> Hell you know, yes. you know, because if you're going to go in hard, yeah. you know, <laughs> you're going to come, you're gonna come out soft. <laughs> uh, so, yes. um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I have I have been past the edge of any dream I ever had, and what I have come to understand, and I understood this when I was five years old, is. You know, we have the story of if you've been entrusted with much, you're responsible for more. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I've been entrusted with the universe. Mm -hmm. And if you've been entrusted with that, what's more? And what's more is to awaken in people the remembrance that we've all been entrusted with the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so if we see ourselves in a place where we can watch somebody and go, man, how did he do that? 
one of the mistakes we've made for the last several thousand years is we've made the mistake of looking at the idol of the individual and we've said, oh, I wish I could be like, rather than actually going, oh, hold on a minute, the thing I just saw, the miracle I just saw, the possibility I just saw was actually a reminder to awaken within me the potential of doing that. Mm -hmm. And so what I've done is I've hit slow motion on life. I've decided that rather than just running around the world doing interesting things like I love to do, the phase of life I'm in right now is to make sure other people have the bridge to actually reawaken their memory of their possibility. And so what I do is I manifest things and, you know, the official credentials, I run hedge funds and I run quant funds and I run the three top performing global equity indexes and you know, and, and I advise governments and I go into post-conflict reconstruction and I write constitutions and I, I, do, I do a lot of stuff. But my commitment now is to say, how do I bring the humanity of what I'm doing into everything I'm doing so that it reawakens in others the fact that the best thing that could ever happen is to have every one of my footprints erased so that when we get to the end of the road and people go, Something was here. And we don't know what the something quite was, but we know it was here and we know it lit something inside of us. Because just like we don't need heroes anymore, we also don't need villains. Right? We, we don't need that trick, the, the Hollywood flourish of, in 90 minutes, I'm going to get you to love that guy and hate that mm -hmm. guy, right? We don't need that anymore. We need a world in which we can activate the memory of our essence in every being, in every instance, in every place, so that the ripple effect, so the light we light propagates. And like anything else, you know, after a while, you stop looking at the light bulb and you start looking at what got illuminated. Mm -hmm. And so I often say when people ask what I do, I say I'm a light choreographer. Mm. and mm -hmm. I love where that goes because it lands in a oh whoa <laughs> and the reason I love that language is the set's already here yeah. right we all are the actors on the stage but if you don't have somebody to kind of guide the narrative with with the light then it kind of just looks like a warehouse until you realize that over there is the study and then over there is the bedroom and over there is the city street. And, you know, the choreographic nature of light is my business. Well, and, and I <clears throat> thank you for that. And I'm, and I'm going to get into the work that you and your wife, Kim, do. Yeah. Because I think that's, that's uh, phenomenal and I look forward to participating in that with my wife, Peyton. But before we do that, I think this is a good segue already into what we chatted about last night in light within a seashell. Yeah. And where that actually comes from. And yeah. like you blew my mind multiple well, it, times, but that was the one I was like, dude, what? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense that the shiny side of the shell is on the inside. Right. And, and so here's a fascinating question and, and we know this. So for example, when, when a sperm and an egg come together and we have the moment of conception, there's what's called a zinc spark. And, and I love that, right? Every story of creation begins with a bolt of lightning. And that doesn't matter if it's the macro cosmic creation or the intimate, you know, fertilization of an egg. That moment where the zinc goes, and it's that beautiful little spark of life. We all are lit within. We are light. We are a lattice, a template of light. And we thereby create a standing wave of energy, which is how we, we organize, our bodies organize and everything else. But I always was fascinated by the fact that if you look at mother of pearl, you look at the inside of an abalone shell, you look at the inside of any shell, you see this amazing iridescent property. Mm. And your brain very rarely stops and reflects on the fact that, hold on a minute, iridescence, that's the dynamics of light. That's the nature of light. What is that doing on the gooey inside of that shell because it feels like that doesn't make any sense. Why would you put an optical property? Why would you put a luminous property inside of a shell? And these are mollusks. I mean, we're not talking about like brains and hearts and we're talking about mollusks, right? 
so so why is it that cultures around the world have so obsessed about shells? And I think it's because they know something. I think that they know that we're lit from within. I think the inner flame, the inner fire, whatever language you want to put in it, is actually an opportunity for us to realize that we organize around light. We are born of light. We eat light. You know, when we grab that glucose molecule that comes through a fruit or a vegetable or food or anything else, when we break down proteins and get all the way down to, you know, the glycogen and and all of the stuff that our body consumes, all we're doing is emancipating light. Mm. Our mitochondria are unlocking sunlight all the time, all the time, all the time. What is that? Well, we are born of light, that zinc flash. We are sustained by light. Every piece of calorie that we ever release is born of light. And I think we forget time and time again that that inner light is in fact what we send out to the universe. And I think we obsess about the geometry of reflected light. You know, we, we're tricked by our eyes into thinking that's the light. That's the reality. But the truth is that the only thing we perceive in the outside world is the reflected essence of what a thing isn't. Because the energy that's absorbed, the light energy that's absorbed, we don't see, right? The only thing a a tree leaf is, is not green, right? Because it reflected the green out. It absorbed all the reds and the blues and the yellows and everything else. The only thing it isn't is green, but we get tricked into going, oh, leaves are green. No, the only, the only, only thing they're not is what they reflect back. That's the amazing thing. That's how reflectance works. That's how color works. That's how edges and shape works. It took like five minutes for my brain to go into a pretzel already, but go ahead. But, but, but how cool <laughs> yeah. is it to realize that, that our eyes are tricking us? Right? They're, they're allowing us to think that we're perceiving, but we're invited all the time, all the time, to just slow down to the speed of consciousness. To just drop in and say, okay, hold on a minute. The trick is, I think I'm looking at you. But if I look at you and I don't drop in, then did I actually see the man that you really are? Mm -hmm. Did I see the energy that you carry? Did I see the conflicts that you try to to champion every day? Did I see any of those things? And, And the trick is that I could say I saw you. And I would be totally blind because the only thing I got was that which you were not, the reflected properties of the essence that you didn't absorb. And I think we as people fail time and time again. I mean, pick the label. It's Christian. It's Muslim. It's this. It's that. It's ethnicity. It's black. It's white. It's Indian. It's We get tricked into this optical separation, this optical segregation, and we fail to stop and go, nope, that's a trick. I want to drop one layer down. I want to see what is the essence that you've absorbed. I want to know what's inside. I want to know what lights you up, what makes you tick. And that's why I think the shells are smarter than us. Right, a mollusk. A single-footed organism is smarter than this, right? Mm. What an amazing question. And the minute you let yourself have permission to ask questions like, are we blind to the light within? A whole host of things gets resolved and a whole host of new things opens up as questions that are probably worth asking. And they've been around for how many thousands of years? Yeah, probably 80 million, 80 years, million years unaltered. So and they're the same exact. They have figured out the light within. And you and you shared that they actually their shell is an EMF protection yeah it's funny i mean you know solar flares have wiped out furry things and lizardy things and things with short arms with big teeth you know there's a lot of stuff that hasn't survived but you know you can go to the top of a mountain in utah or in colorado and you can pick up a shell fossil that's millions and millions of years old and you can go to the beach and get exactly the same shell and it turns out that while there is a deep mystery in how the actual calcium deposition happens it happens in hexagons which is really interesting there's a there's a deep kind of metaphysical thing about six that i i I obsess about (laughs) you'll find out more about that obsession yeah but so there's this really interesting thing about the geometry but the way in which that 
calcium deposition happens, nobody actually can figure out why shells are so precise in how they layer these little hexagons of calcium on the outside, which actually creates this dissipation layer of energy. And I have a hunch, and this is a hunch, you know, we're playing around the edges of it, we're playing with some of this, but Mm -hmm. I have a hunch that a shell has actually figured out how to avoid being contaminated by large amounts of electromagnetic radiation. And it's probably the reason why you can look at a fossil and you can look at a shell on a beach and go, hold on a minute, nothing has changed. Mm -hmm. You know, and pretty much everything else has. So shells have something that's really special and it's something that we're looking at right now because we're living in a world where the EMF pollution, the EMF frequency kind of just interference that's happening in our biology and in our sociology is actually a real concern. And so we're right now, one of the things that I'm doing and some of my colleagues are doing is looking into what can we learn from a shell, which is kind of an interesting question. Well, and yeah, and you pointed out that it's, it was kind of the original blockchain, correct? Absolutely. It Which turns ties out us, that- we, we fast forward <laughs> 80 million years. Yeah. yeah, because it actually records every bit of the transactions that it has, the what it's eaten, the where it's been, the what the water conditions are, what the gas conditions of the atmosphere are. All of those things are layered in there. You know, we think of rings on a tree and we can be blunt instruments going, oh, well, that was a rainy year or that's the year of the yes. fire or <laughs> duh, right? Yeah. But a shell is sitting there going, no, I'm going to give you the minute by minute. How much gas, how much pH, no how much shit. this, how much that. How much? It is, it oh, is filled with information God. where, you know, our brilliance, like we are so Neanderthal when we come to this, which is, oh, yeah, I think it was a rainy year. Uh, <laughs> Okay, genius. Thanks. I mean, and fat you, ring. <laughs> and, and you and you assert that when we can really unlock that technology, when we yeah. can really understand yeah. that blockchain, that it opens up a whole world of possibilities. For yeah, us, well, we're operating on a different frequency. Yeah. Listen, I mean, you know, there's been tons of really smart people that have said this, so I'm not even close to in that zone, mm. but. You know, people talk about you can't, you can only solve problems by changing the consciousness in which you're engaging because you can't solve a problem in the same consciousness you created it. And, and I think that's, there's a lot of truth to that. But I think there's something that's missed by the really smart people. And that is, I think, when you tune into the frequency, when you say, okay, hold on a minute, the universe has been giving us these, these beautiful carved artifacts called fossils. And that's not an interesting archaeological thing. That's not an interesting geological thing. It's an interesting ontological thing. There's actual Break. meaning, okay. ontological. It's gotcha. the framework through which we examine and experience reality. It's, it's that, that shell that we put around ourselves to go, we're going to perceive things through this lens. Mm. Now, here's the cool thing. When you start dropping into the frequency of saying, hey, I think nature, you have something to teach me right? And that could be photosynthesis. It could be glucose in the Krebs cycle. It could be a shell and a fossil. It could be, you know, you name it. If you drop into the frequency of saying, hey, I am your student. You are my teacher. Now just let me know what there is to learn. I think nine times out of 10, allowing yourself to enter the frequency of the consciousness of the thing you're studying, the thing gives back. And it starts teaching you how to use it. And it starts Mm. teaching you how to think about it. And, you know, people talk about this with plant medicine. They talk about it with, you know, various dietary processes, spiritual processes, and so forth. The truth is, we could learn a lot from a rock. Mm. You know, we could learn a lot from a bivalve. (laughs) And and instead, we freaking just go, yeah, I'll take 20 oysters. And, And we forget that inside of those things is a genius of the universe, a microcosm of questions that we've never thought to ask. Yeah, it calls to mind for me, back in July, I did a, you know, Peyton and, and two of our kids were were up north, and I was here with my son, Jake, and I was like, this was a time for, I, you know, I wanted to do a five-day dieta, where it was yeah. really just unplugging and kind of communing with nature and really getting in touch, and the different practices that I use, I, I uh, use some hape, which is for, for those who don't know, it's a sacred Amazonian tobacco that um, you ingest through the nose and 
got super clear during that period when I would go out in nature, there were all these messages that I had been missing. Yeah. And it was just being attuned to that field, even in that short period of time, but just having the intention yep. of just wanting to learn and being kind of the humble servant. I was I was blown away at all the the messages I was receiving. Well, it's funny. I, I work with Teresa Eric in Papua New Guinea. And we formed one of the early organic cocoa supply uh, kind of regenerative farming methods in, in the Pacific. And I've, of, I've often puzzled over how on earth somebody figured out cacao. right? Because if you look at an actual cocoa pod mm -hmm. and you open it up, it looks like kind of a, I don't know, an alien swamp creature, kind of gooey, messy, pus-filled, gross like, I, I have no idea how somebody could have gone, oh, dude, how, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't see that. Ferment it, dry it, roast it, grind it, blah, 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 <laughs> and chocolate. Like, yes. what? Like, how many steps of improbability go from a pussy, you know, gooey mess that really doesn't look appealing? And man, when you taste it, it tastes like shit. It is not good. Oh, like, yeah. It's, it's hideous. Yeah. And, and so yeah. somebody yeah. goes, no, dude, just ferment it. Just No. See, somebody dropped into the frequency of what that thing was and said, okay, I'm going to sit through the gooey phase, and then I'm going to sit through the fermentation phase, and then I'm going to sit through the drying phase. I'm going to sit through all these other phases. And, and I'm not naive enough to think that humans figured that out. Yes. That was communion. That was communion with nature. And I love what you just described, but I'm going to give you my, my expression of the same thing. In mm. 2015, I really genuinely wanted to know whether I loved myself because I was pretty sure I didn't. And I had two beautiful friends who decided to give me a week away at a monastery in Southern Colorado, just outside of, of um, the Durango area. <clears throat> And at this monastery, I got a little tiny 200 square foot cabin at the top of a mountain. And so I hiked up there as I was almost to the trailhead to go to my cabin. The person who was kind of administering this thing said, do you, do you want to be accompanied up? I said, no, I, I'm good. I'm just going to go up. I'm ready to walk away from everything. So I went up to the cabin and it was as though I was led or voice. I don't, I don't, I can't tell you it wasn't acoustic, but it was like, it said unpack. So I unpacked my bag, and it said, now unpack. So I was like, oh, all right. I'm up on the top of a mountain in Colorado. Nobody's around. So I started taking everything off. <clears throat> everything. Hmm. And then the same impulse said, never put anything on that isn't you again. And so for a week, I was at the top of a mountain in Colorado, climbing other mountains that were neighboring mountains, absolutely naked. <laughs> 100 percent no way i love it 100 percent naked and it was it was cool because you know there's some probably some some bobcats or whatever the hell they were that are sitting there going dude there was a guy like he was so not buddhist we know that like he was <laughs> um but 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 here's the funny thing get to the end of the week and i won't talk about the week because the week holy cow i mean i i fell in love with me the second day mm. i gave myself a fast from everything, including words, where I wouldn't allow myself to name anything. Oh, Just so let hard. a tree be a tree. Let a wind be a wind. Let a sunbeam be a sunbeam. Let sweat running down your skin just be sweat running down your skin. Don't name anything. Just live what is unfolding. And, um, and I screwed it up. Um, I walked into my cabin. There was a solar hot water shower bag, and I saw the letters S-O-L-A-R. Oh. And my brain read solar, and I was like, ah, shit. <laughs> and then, so solar was my first one. Um, I told you I didn't have anything on. I went outside on the deck, took a step down into the woods, and got a splinter in my foot and said, oh, shit. And I said it out loud. So solar, oh, shit. <laughs> and then I did this epic hike at like 4.30 because I wanted to see the sunset on the top of a mountain. So I went up the top of a mountain, and I watched the sunset. <laughs> I walk back down yes. and I and I'm walking towards the cabin and I uttered the following words. Well done, Dave. Those are my six violations on my day of fasting from words. What flowed from me the next three days 
in a journal that I kept. And now it's, you know, in a lot of essays that I've written, I've included some of it in my book, uh, my latest book, Lizards Eat Butterflies. Um, what flowed from my mind after I gave myself the permission to fall in love with me and the permission to fall in love with nature as it is, not as I name it, not as I see it, not as I've been told to examine it, but just nature as it is. That fast was what transformed my life. Because I realized that even by as simple as naming a thing, I actually robbed it of its essence. Mm. And its essence had so much to teach me if I just let it be it, right? And if it just knew that I was me. And that transformation is something that I cherish, but I also feel like, man, what a gift. Like, what a gift for any of us to give ourselves is permission to drop in the frequency of being fully human. And I found out that I love myself. And here's the punchline at the end. I went to put my clothes back on because I had to, you know, go back down to uh, largely women's (laughs) Buddhist monastery. So that was going to be a thing. Um, And I got all the way down to one artifact left, which was my signet ring from the University of Virginia when I got my PhD. And I went to put it on my finger. And I erupted into tears. And I mean soul level, rip your soul out tears. And I was like, what the hell just happened? This is, I'm putting a ring on. It's, yeah. not, it's a thing. They're like, come on, right? guy, get your shit like, together. It's a ring. This is not your crisis point. <laughs> <laughs> Look what you just went through. Yeah. You just did shit. This You've is been not naked a thing. for a week. Um, and it turns out that it started dawning on me. Cal, I was a smart guy when I was 20. I was going around the world doing some pretty cool shit. But I had this ego problem of I was a young, brash, bright person who bought the bullshit that I needed a credential. Yes. The identity. And that was why I did that trip because I realized that the reason why I didn't love myself is I chose to stop loving myself. When I started letting people tell me, man, you're bright, but man, if you just had your PhD, we could listen to you. Fuck. And so I love, by the way, right now when fact checkers go, oh, he has a PhD in this and that and the other thing. I'm like, yeah, you fuckers, you have no idea. <laughs> you have no idea. That PhD is, is like ashes in my mouth yep. because... It represented the one and probably most visible time where I set my own well-being, my own knowledge, my own sense of identity aside, and I let the system tell me what credential I needed to be me. That ring has never gotten back on my finger. Ugh. I hope you still have it, though, yeah. as a beautiful reminder I do. I of, do. of that lesson, because what <laughs> you're speaking to right there... There's not a person listening right now who can't connect to that. Met- right. We all have our own ring, yep. maybe several of them. Oh, and God, yeah. Just, you know, and at that point, you had to go through that. Right. Thankfully, you had the awareness when you put it back on that that was the thing. Yeah. And a lot of us never get to that. Yeah. Just carry, we wear that ring with such pride. Look oh, at, yeah. And it's yeah. our, we're so attached to that as a part of our identity. I used to do it with, my level of fitness, like yeah. 40 something years old and, you know, and I would get praised for it. Like, dude, look, you're in such great shape. Well, yeah. I want to be like you yeah. when I get yeah. older. And it's like the head just gets bigger and bigger and you can kind of play it off. But inside you're like, yeah, fuck, that feels good. <laughs> until exactly you right. until you understand how that can destroy you. Yeah. You just start chasing, like you said, it's you're trying to be something that you're not. Right. But people are reflecting what they see and that feels good and it's just such this external it, it, the external validation is so crippling because it almost it works is. well and, and it is it's so seductive so because seductive. listen i mean i was a 20 what when i got done 24 25 year old arrogant confident mm. effective executive and i was working in japan where you want to mind fuck, be 20 something, be a professor, be a CEO, and be Dr. David Martin. 
I would go. I, I did a speaking tour of all of Japan, starting up north, working my way all the way down to near Kobe. And it was funny because I'd often be heading up to the head table and whoever the sponsoring executive was. My favorite one was uh, Shiseido. The CEO of Shiseido came up and said, oh, no, no, no. This is for uh, Dr. David Martin. I was like, yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they go, oh, no, 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 no. This is for Shacho, CEO, David Martin. I said, yeah, that, that's me. <laughs> And you can watch this guy, he's 60-something, and you can watch his brain just go, <laughs> like a freaking squirrel on crack, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, he go, and he tried to, he goes, oh, no, no, no. This is for Sensei, Professor, Shacho, CEO, Dr. David Martin. And I said, yeah, that's me. <laughs> and here I am, like, I've just destroyed, like, 800 years of Japanese appropriate culture. Yes. By being a 20-something-year-old person. And here's the cool thing. We built a great friendship. It was awesome. It was beautiful because that that polarity of he had a worldview, and then I just shattered it. But I didn't do it in, an, an, in a disrespectful way. I did it in a, hey, yep, yeah, that's me, that's me, that's me, that's me. And I reflect on those moments, and I realize that that was who I was. I, I was all of those that's you right. know, things, right? Mm-hmm. But the reason I was there was because I was Dave Martin. That's why I was there. It was what I brought. It was the intellect. It was the perspective. It was the insight that I brought. That's why I was there. But all of the window dressings of the labels and the titles and everything else were the things that credentialed me into the room, right? If I had just been 26-year-old backpacker Dave Martin, I would have never been in that room. That's right. So so I don't, I don't denigrate mm-hmm. the experience, but... To your point, the seduction yeah. of dropping in and going, oh, that is who I am. And oh, yeah, I'm pretty badass. And hey, I got I got my resolve at 38 years old to be the fittest I ever was at 40. And that's a big, big order, given the fact that I had massive accident, took me out of my amazing track career, lost both legs, wheelchair for a long time, like never supposed to walk again, all that kind of stuff. Come on. I was at, at 38 years old. I was at Le Meridian Piccadilly, best gym in London. So there you go, Le Meridian. You can pay us, you know, <laughs> write it out to Cal and you yes. know, send him the promo. <laughs> yeah. But I was at that gym and, and I was flying back from India and I was, I was doing my first bench reps and, I, and I, I felt a little off. I got off the plane, you know, straight into the hotel, straight into the gym. And I felt like there was something wrong because I picked up these plates and I put them on the on the bar and I was like, shit, I must like have a virus or a weird shit something. I don't know what's going on. And so I get down and I squeeze out three reps and I'm like, oh, I think I'm dead. Like something's really wrong. And this guy comes up to me and goes, shit, man, that's amazing. And I said, no, it isn't. It's like half the weight I usually do. Oh, yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and, 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 and he goes, it's kilos, yes. mate. It's kilos. Yes. And, and, and there it was. I had actually gotten within two pounds of my college max at 38. And I was like, okay, hold on a minute. Why did I call it my max? So I made a resolution at 38. I'm going to be fittest at 40, which I did. Killed it. Benched 328 on my 40th birthday. Hercules. Awesome. Right. And then a couple weeks later, ripped my rotator cuff because I found out what my real max is. <laughs> like my max is when my shoulder actually rips off my body. And, and I'm confident to say that was a max. But here's the cool thing. Then I was like, shit, I did that at 40. I wonder if I could do it at 50. And you know what I did? I beat my max of 40 on my 50th birthday. So now I'm closing in on... How old are you now? I'm 54 in a couple weeks. Okay. I'm closing in on, can I beat it at 60? And here's the thing. The thing is, I have realized that the limits that I have imposed... And by the way, here's the worst part about it. My limits are cool limits, right? I'm a CEO. I'm an executive. I'm blah, 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 blah. Yeah. My limits are bullshit because I'm actually celebrated for the things people think I have achieved or they think I've done. And the worst part about it is you can start reflecting back that bullshit and go, well, yeah, I guess, you know, it's pretty cool and I'm pretty, yeah, pretty switched oh, on. Kool-Aid. And dude, you know what? Drop into it and go, nah. I got to go back naked on the top of that mountain and go, what is the Dave Martin that I love? 
-hmm. And the cool thing is I have that mountain. Mm -hmm. And I've never come off it. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I'm curious, by the way. Yeah. Do you have some cool story on how you ended up like walking again? <clears throat> Because you seem like within you, there's something I, and I'm spec, <laughs> I'm totally speculating here, but the, the what I know from you, there's got to be some story about how how you rose from the ashes. You know, um, you've met my my wife Kim. Yeah. And by the way, if there isn't, just make yeah, up a good no, story. No, no, it's a good story. Okay. Um, oh, you're you've lovely. met my you, oh, just she's amazing. Like the yeah. air that I breathe. By the way, one of the first things I ever heard about you from Mickey was. How much you adore your wife. Yeah. That was, he, and he said that to me a couple different times. And I'm like, I need to know that guy. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, and, and I'll tell you what, if, if you and I ever figure out the one thing we can give this world is we need to have permission as men to actually really love women, not love women the way we've been told we love women, like really, really love women. And that's getting authentic as guys again. I'm in a I mean, deep process of that right dude, now. Dude, so, that, yeah, that is the thing. On. But so, but but here's part of it, and that's why I'm loving your question, and this is not the answer okay. that anybody would expect, but that's okay. Yeah. My former wife, with whom I spent 28 years, um, and she had her own journey, and it was a beautiful journey, and the cool thing is I made vows to support the emergence of who she was going to become. The cool thing is... Those vows were fulfilled. She became who she was going to become. It didn't include me. That was a tough thing for me to face. I was facing it when I was on that mountaintop, um, so that's cool. Uh, but it opened up the door for my relationship with Kim. But I have to say this. Shortly after I got home from the hospital, after my accident, um, which for those of you gruesome, like, you know, drive by, slow down, what the hell happened? Yeah. I was in a long jump competition, first outdoor meet of the season. I jumped into the pit, first comp competitive jump. We had done run-throughs, but I, it was my first competitive jump. I was the first jumper. And what no one realized is the pit crew hadn't dug the permafrost out of the ice in the ground. So when my legs hit, Come on. they ripped sideways. So my feet were sticking up, knees ripped sideways, legs ripped sideways. Both of them sitting next. I've blown out, like blown out everything in both legs. So that's the accident. But, oh my. So when I got home from the hospital, God. Um, uh, Colleen, my former wife, was watching just the anguish of, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And, and we had just been married. We had been married for a couple months. So, I mean, this was not, not a good recipe for kind of newlywed bliss. Um, hospital bed, toilet in the kitchen, you know, that kind of stuff. So, not um, an extended honeymoon, so to speak. Yeah, not. Yeah, you wouldn't put it on the to-do <laughs> list. Um, but but here's the cool thing. She actually realized that that I, I, it was an existential problem. Like, I had an identity as an athlete. I had an identity as being fit. I had an identity as obsessed with, you know, what my body was and what was capable of and everything else. And so... I don't know what it was, a couple months maybe into my hospital bed, she went out and bought a mountain bike. Now, I'd, I'd ridden bikes, but I hadn't, like, really become a cyclist ever because I ran and I did a bunch of other things. She bought a mountain bike and set it next to the hospital bed. Oh. Mm. Just set it there. Mm. And I went through every emotion, like, you know, you're taunting me, yeah. right? Or that was the first thing I thought. Whatever. But okay. But, but it wasn't. I, yeah. It wasn't. It was actually really cool because here's what we did. Once once I could move my legs at all, which was just moving my hips, she would wheel me out of my wheelchair. I would get on the bike. Oh. She would help put my feet into the clips of the pedals. And then she would walk beside the bike and just let my feet passively move because I had no control of my legs. And she'd walk next to my bike you know, holding the bike up, holding me mm -hmm. up, and we would do that. And then gradually, I started getting some movement from my hips, and I could actually kind of push the pedals. I had massive braces and crap all over the place, so it wasn't. You'd feel just a little tension. But just it. enough where I could kind of get the pedals to move. And we were in Indiana, so flatter than pancakes, so mm. it didn't matter. I mean, there's no hill to worry about anything else. So I got to the place where I could go out and ride by nothing but my glutes in my hip. 
right? My legs weren't working, but I could ride with just my glutes and my butt and, you know, just make it happen. And I'd, I'd roll up, get on my bike on the edge of the porch, out of the wheelchair, ride around and crash back into the porch and get back in my wheelchair. So <laughs> I was riding before I was walking. Oh, shit. And that's in many, I mean, most of the surgeons that have seen my case said that, that, that practice that that just keep passive motion going in my legs may have been why blood started resupplying my legs and then you know tissue started growing again and and so the cool thing is and here's the beautiful thing about your question despite all of the challenges that my former wife and I had I have to say that one of the things that she knew was that if you put something next to that kind of environment of absolute despair, um, I'm likely going to go for it. And the reason I'm going to end the story where I am is because when I met Kim in Antarctica, it was very clear that my former wife and I's, you know, relationship has so far left the building. You know, it ended in 2014. It was 2015 when we met. But what the, what the cool thing about that experience was, was actually Colleen was very instrumental in reaching out to Kim and having communications about me with Kim. Mm -hmm. In fact, they arranged our first date in Sydney in um, August 8th of 2015. And I tell you that because that's, that's a gift, right? Very few people have that gift. Mm -hmm. Very few people have the gift of saying, you know, how do I create a field into which the new can emerge? And for all of the things that I don't appreciate about her and about my experience with her, because there's a laundry list of things that I don't appreciate, Mm -hmm. I do honor the fact that she knew enough about my essence and my character. She knew that if I was ever going to walk again, I had to start riding. Like she had that, Mm. she was able to grok that somehow. And and I I will forever be grateful for it. Um, and, And I think that I think we need to be able to do that. I think we need to be able to honor the contributions that have been made even by those that maybe weren't entirely honorable. That's beautiful. Yeah. Thanks for, for sharing that. And um, again, I think it, in our world today, there's not a lot of nuance. Yeah. It's black or white. Yeah. Right. You're good or bad. Yeah. You're on one side or the other mask, anti-mask, whatever the, whatever it is, and with that, it's like this is great appreciation for how she showed up. Yeah. And and even, I would say, when the relationship ended, grateful that it ended when it did because it, it, it offered you the opportunity to go spend that time on the mountain. Oh, which yeah. Is, which yeah. you needed for you. Yeah. And and I think, you know, it's such a sucker punch. And, and we, we do ourselves a disservice every time we pretend like we're judge, jury, and executioner on mm. our own stories. Right. If we drop into the story of every bit of our life, seriously drop into relationship stories, business stories, anything else, the minute we've decided <laughs> we've judged it, we've lost the plot. Like, totally lost the plot. There was something there where our judgment is closure on the act of consideration. Judgment is the yes. closure wow. on the act of consideration because you've decided there's enough data, I'm done. And the minute you have that impulse, man, just hit the brakes and go, no, that's, that's a hijack of my integrity. That's a hijack of my capability. And I'm not going to let that happen. Yeah. It's like taking like, what is actually just happening without the judgment and like create enough space for it to just be there as a happening. It, and it, it's what you were just talking about when you, you had the, the fast. Yeah. It's like you, you didn't, you know, when we, name a tree or name an album we create that separation and we we rob it of its essence yeah and it's the it's the same idea that we like just being with what is just we're so we're so tuned into that and it's because it's we can't hold we we're not we're not taught to hold it all because yeah. we think we need to tie all these bows around everything and get to the bottom of it and have an answer and then move on because the our brain is trained that way. But like when we create the space for us not to not to know yeah. the outcome. Yeah. And just to let it be and 
it just, oh, that's been such a gift for me to finally step into just some peace around that. Like, I don't, I don't need to know. I don't, yeah. I don't really need to know. I can have like the inquiry that gets the curiosity going, that gets into more inquiry. And then you start to go down those rabbit holes. And sure, there are things where you're going to get to the bottom of something yeah. right in your work yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But, but those deeper questions, it's just more inquiry. Yeah. And I think, you know, people certainly after Mickey and my collaboration last year, you know, tons of people are sitting there going, oh, you're the guy that does research and you're the guy that does investigation. You're the guy that does this and that and the other thing. And they make the mistake of thinking that the artifact of the knowledge that I shared is the product of my work. That's not true. It's an artifact, but that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Because what I really do is I try to understand what's underneath the story because I'm not interested in the artifact of the story. I'm interested in what gave rise to the impulse, good or bad. I want to know what it is because I think that particularly for those of us who have been entrusted with a voice, uh, influence, anything else, I think the minute we jump on the judgment bandwagon, we've lost our credibility. 100%. Um, so I'm confident in saying, you know, Anthony Fauci violated federal law. And the reason I'm confident in saying that is because it's objectively true. And he did it, you know, hundreds of times, which is objectively true. There's a Bayh-Dole Act, he violated it. There's a Patriot Act, he violated it. There's a bunch of things he's done that he violated. Now, what I have not said is something about his essence. Mm -hmm. What I have said is something about his action, and his action, we can look at and objectively say, hey, you know what? In this country, we have laws. These laws are on the books. They're not subject to my interpretation or your interpretation. They are what they are. And if you choose to violate it, you have, right? When I drove over for this podcast, I watched the speed limit, okay? Now, did I always stay within the speed limit? No. No. So did I break a law? Yes, I did. Does that necessarily make me a criminal? Does that make me nefarious? Does it make, no, but it does mean that I made a choice that said at certain points in time, I'm going to concern myself with that. And at other points in time, I'm not going to. Now, I do that, right? You probably do that. Like, we all probably do that. But I, but I think, it. yeah, I, well, you didn't, but... <laughs> I bet Peyton does. Yeah, um, my son Jake <laughs> definitely does. Drives like an asshole. Yeah. So, um, but but the funny thing is, we make decisions, and that and, and so we can actually judge a moment of an artifact of an action that that we can judge because mm. we can just objectively say, oh, that's a thing that happened. The minute we actually drop into the essence of that judgment and say that person is, right, that's where we draw a bright line. Because when we move into the, I'm going to let the artifact of your experience judge you as the essence of who you are, we're blinded to something. And that's really important because we often blind ourselves to either apathy, where we go, eh, it's probably not a big deal, or mm. we overjudge. We go in and say, God, how can those evil people do evil things? And it's like, okay, hold on a minute. How can those people lose touch with humanity mm. and then do the things that they're doing. You see the difference? Like oh. just drop into that frequency oh. and all of a sudden you're actually effective. Yes. Which is part of the reason why after, I don't know, a year plus of podcasts, of interviews, of videos, so far YouTube has taken one video down. Facebook hasn't taken any of them. What video did they take down? The one I talked about Anthony Fauci on. Yep. But, but I talked about things that are far more controversial. I talked about the origins of the virus. I talked about all sorts of other things. None of them have been touched. And I, and I have a number of people who are pretty convinced that I'm in league with some sort of, you know, occult that has figured out the magic bullet that uh, avoids censorship <laughs> or whatever. I probably am. I didn't even know. I, I found out that I was, a, you know, I, I found out by accident that I was number 23 on the top 25 list of QAnon influencers. And I didn't yes. even know there was a list. No shit. I'm 23. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> um, and, and I beat out Sasha Stone by one. He's 24. No so shit. Yes. Rock that. Um, but what's fun about all of it is we haven't attacked the person. 
we have actually brought light to the action, the artifact, the the experience that that person has manifest. Well, and I love. Uh, I got a few, a bunch of things rolling through here. I want to get to. Before I get to why has Anthony Fauci not been charged with yeah. these crimes, uh, w- let's just actually go there because in that I <laughs> Cause fucking it's totally <laughs> forgot what I was going to ask, but I'm going to come back to it, I promise. Yeah, well, listen, I mean, people don't understand that our legal system, our judicial system in the United States is, is the weakest it's probably ever been. Um, and it's not started in the last few months. Back in 2002 and 2003, my company was responsible for, at the time, the second largest tax fraud bust in U.S. history. Corporations violating the Internal Revenue Code. And, you know, we had, we had U.S. attorneys. We had attorneys general. We had the antitrust division of the Justice Department. We had the criminal enforcement division of the IRS. All chapter and verse, you know, we had nailed all of these companies to the wall. So much so that the head of the criminal prosecution arm of the IRS actually wrote a personal note to us saying, I want you to know that on my own personal account, my personal email, I'm telling you that you guys are bringing light to a thing that is in desperate need of attention and we should be prosecuting it. But because the White House has advisors from the companies that are complicit in the fraud there is a high probability that this will never be prosecuted. I think we all want to believe in a world That's right. where if you commit a crime, you know you're a criminal and you do some time or you do whatever. That's not the world we live in. And, and the more white collar the crime, the more esoteric, and, and here's the tragedy, the more people who are harmed because of the action, you actually get less likelihood of prosecution. So Anthony Fauci, without question, is responsible for the deaths and murders of thousands of people. You know, nursing home scandal in New York is the tip of the iceberg. The number of people who have lost their lives because of statements made by Anthony Fauci, where this isn't kind of weaving the web together. This is explicit statements he's made have resulted in the death of people. Now, that may be manslaughter. It may be premeditated murder. I don't care what it is, but the likelihood that he'll be prosecuted is near zero. If I went out and shot somebody, one person, there'd be a manhunt. They'd find me. I'd be tried for murder. But Anthony Fauci can get away with it because not unlike what Plato talks about in the Republic, which I love this. I mean, this is an old problem. This is not new to us. That's why I said it's not a new thing. Sure. In Plato's Republic, he talks about the fact that, you know, the common criminal is judged to be bad. But then there's this threshold effect of if you kind of go to, you know, when when 15 people go missing across three years and their bodies are found in canyons, we go, ooh, serial killer. We, we, we actually move out of our consternation of murder and we start asking the question of, I wonder what's going on. Like, what's the... And, and so we... We turn it into a novel. We make it We make it this thing that is not what it is. And so we have another layer of that, which is what Plato talks about in The Republic, which I absolutely love, which is in The Republic, Plato talks about the fact that you can get to that next level of criminality, that next level that says, I have done such egregious acts so many people affected, so many people harmed, so many people destroyed, I can get to the next level where I can actually arrive at a point where people marvel at the possibility that I could have been as evil as I was. So, for example, people sit there going, well, how could Hitler have killed 8 million people? How could Pol Pot kill millions of his own people? How could, you know, the Cultural Revolution jeopardize the livelihoods of 40 million people. And Plato says that there's a fundamental problem we have as humanity where the more egregious the crime, the more people who are impacted, the more we marvel at the possibility they could do it. And this is the weirdest thing because we can't handle a shooter that goes into a grocery store and kills five people. But we can handle the most compensated federal employee in the United States murdering people and no one says a thing, Mm. right? 
So Plato's paradox, which is the more are harmed, the more we marvel, is actually something as alive and well today as it was when Socrates and Plato were hanging out in the hot tub. Mm, I hear that. And I, I, I actually wasn't familiar with that, so thank you for sharing. Yeah, it. well, it's kind of cool when you think about the fact that, you know, we're hitting play on yeah. a very old album here. Yes. That brings to mind, we're in, we're in, we're in a, we spoke about it the other night, year one yeah. of a cycle. Yeah. That has, this has been repeating for a number of years. So I would love for you to speak about the cycle and maybe give us a good example from the past about why we've seen this before. Yeah, well. I think the most recent memory example is probably the global financial crisis from 2001 to 2007, right? Because we were told that it was patriotic after 9-11 to go out and consume and consume and consume. So we all turned our houses into ATMs. We extended credit. We did all kinds of crazy things. And that was all supposedly patriotic. The whole time what we were doing was justifying China building its infrastructure to manufacture cheap shit that they were selling to us. So that's kind of an interesting paradox. The pro-American decision was to build the economy of China. Last time I checked, it's probably not a pro-American decision, but that's, you know, that's me being judgmental, right? Yes, yes. What a prick. (laughs) (laughs) Um, but, 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 you know, that's what we did. For seven years, we built an infrastructure that allowed the, you know, Amazons of the world and it allowed the Walmarts of the world and allowed everybody of the world to actually go, let's build all of our manufacturing in Chengdu and let's go do all this kind of cool shit, offshore offshore everything, outsource everything. And so what happened was during that six and a half years, we sold our birthright for a bowl of porridge, or in this case, cheap shoes. Um, Now the tragedy is 2008 comes along and the bill comes due, which is the credit default swap market, which was people betting against people's ability to repay, right? Which is a safe bet. When you take seven-year commercial credit and turn it into 30-year paper, it turns out that the mismatch happens. Mm -hmm. But that was a systematic move on the part of a number of people who knew that they could entrap a society into giving up their future for a very short-term duration thing. So that was a seven-year horizon, 2001, 2008, GFC. But if we go back in history, we see that not long before, in 1929, the Great Depression, blah, 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 the Great Depression. Well, what was the Great Depression? It was actually the birth of the interplay between fixed income because the treasuries were a new thing, right? The Federal Reserve was new back then. So we didn't even have the first maturity cycle of the first Federal Reserve production. And people don't think about that, right? This happened because we had an emerging stock market. We had an emerging financial literacy. We had an emerging middle class that could start participating in the market. And it turns out that there were a large group of people who didn't want to see the middle class get too powerful. Mm. Sound familiar? Mm. And so a couple people decided to start manipulating markets. And before long, we have not only the emergence of what we called the stock market crash, which it really wasn't. It was actually inflated prices on certain things, but it was actually not a crash across the board, which we don't talk about very often. Mm -mm. But what then happened was a climate change problem. Mm. (laughs) Sounds like Greta should have been there then, right? (laughs) (laughs) Where is Greta when we needed her in 1929? (laughs) The Dust Bowl. And, and when we say the Dust Bowl, most of us have this kind of foggy sepia picture that we got from, you know, people sitting on the side of a, you know, burned out saloon somewhere, you know, eating bowls of porridge or whatever yes. the hell they were eating. <laughs> um, but, but that's about as far as we go. Yeah. We don't realize that the Dust Bowl officially lasted from 1930 to 1936. And 1936 is kind of interesting because that's when the world starts going to war. Mm. That's when the Third Reich starts kicking it up. That's when a lot of things start falling apart in terms of geopolitical conflicts. And lo and behold, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't some sort of grand new deal, but it was. Are you ready for this? An American infrastructure deal. Does that sound familiar? I mean, the playbook is so pathetically the same, right? What Biden announced just a couple days ago is $2.3 trillion. We're now going to rebuild our roads and bridges. Well, there was a thing called the CPA. You know what that was? The Citizens Public uh, or Citizens Public Corps or something like that, which was the old public works program. What that was was socializing employment in the 1930s, which then begat the recruitment for the war. You know, people are just freaking not paying attention to the fact that let's just slow the tape down. It's so cool, 
All right, 1929 to 1936. Let's just slow that tape down okay. and go, okay, here's what we do. We get financial instability, mismatch mm. asset prices between <laughs> fixed income and equities. Haven't mm. heard that. <laughs> and then we have an environmental crisis, so we have to deal with climate change. Haven't heard that. No. Right? And then the favorite one of all is we have a government that's messing up an epidemic, but the epidemic then was syphilis. No shit. Because the government was trying to pitch the understanding of how penicillin could be reproducibly used across the population. Come on. Oh, damn. It feels like Playbook 101. Fuck. They haven't even changed the cast of characters. And and listen, we can sit here and 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 pretend like that's just, oh, well, that's Dave being a conspiracy. Bullshit. We infected the Tuskegee Airmen. Right? Mm. We actually put syphilis into populations. Mm. Don't tell me black lives matter. That's bullshit. Mm. Right? What are we trying to do right now? We're trying to get the black arms f- rolling up their sleeves to get inoculated with a gene therapy. Are you fucking kidding me? Mm. Right? This is not a, oh, Dave's just drawing interesting coincidental associations. You know what? If it was one, right? If it was just the Dust Bowl, you'd probably get me. But if it was fixed income, equity price mismatch, uncorrelated mar- market performance, okay, tick that box. We got that one too. Dry powder in banks, three times more dry powder than they need. Why? Because they're going to foreclose on assets and they need to have lost reserves to cover the foreclosures. Guess where we are right now? Three times more assets than banks need. Check the box there, mm. Basel three. So we've got that one. We have a public health crisis where we need an industrial pharmaceutical intervention to save America from a nasty disease. Then it was syphilis, but we don't even think about the fact. Syphilis was one of the leading causes of death in 1950. No shit. Yeah. And we're sitting there going, well, that's probably a conspiracy too. It is, but it's a criminal conspiracy. It's a criminal conspiracy by people who know that they can take advantage of an uneducated, uninformed population. And they can get them to be subservient to an economic power and control manipulation game. That's what it is. And the fact is, they're playing a 1929 to 1936 playbook because it worked. It worked. They're playing the 2001 to 2008 playbook because it worked. And they're doing it all over again. We just finished year one of the seven years we've got to work with which is the reason why people like me are pricks this time around. Mm. Because I wrote blogs in 2005 and six, and I gave lectures at the Arlington Institute to the 25 people who gave a shit. Mm. But now I'm sitting with you in Austin on a podcast, and I'm making it difficult for those assholes to do it again. Mm. Because if we pull some just basic, basic literacy on this thing, and bring some visibility to it, we have a chance of derailing the plan because if we, the people, start acting differently so we don't fall for the same sucker punch that we've gone over and over and over again, we actually have a chance to change the outcome. What's the next steps? We're year one, okay. Yeah, we're year one. At least we're through year one. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, there you go. Well, listen, I think there's a couple things that are really critical, and it starts with some interior work. We have to stop looking for the villains. You know, I, I've talked about this in, in novel form in my book, Coup to 12, that was published in 2011. Um, in 1998, I was invited by several of the families that are currently involved in running the world to take a fairly senior position in the organization that they got together to run the world. And I don't think they were prepared to have me say no. And they had a pretty attractive offer for me to say yes. And I didn't take the offer. But I found out something really important. And it was really important. The individuals who were very intimately involved with making the decisions that are affecting all of our lives have a couple human factors that are deep sources of pain. If we go back in history, one of the things that has led the arc of history down this pathway where it feels like the effortlessness of corruption seems to just happen without 
any disruption. And we sit there going, God, the darkness always seems to have its shit together and the light feels like it doesn't know what it's doing. Mm. Well, it turns out that, that that's because there was always a vision of some sort of dynastic um, entitlement. You know, something that said there's the next generation that's going to carry on the, what we've done. And you know, here's the sad thing, Cal. Every one of the families that are the most influential families have had through tragedy the loss of the son or daughter they wished would carry on their dynasty. Come on. To a person. Whoa. And so that motorboat accident. They just carry that auto with- accidents, a plane crash in one instance, many times, you know, extreme sports or something else. And it was so fascinating because I was about three, four families into this where I started going, oh, shit, there's something here. Because it turns out, and you know this, you've got kids, I've got kids. If you genuinely lost a sense that you're in this for the betterment of your kids, Mm. your consciousness would be seared in a way that that would really be harmful. Now imagine, and this is the part that's most alarming, almost all of them have kids that they're embarrassed of. Oh, yeah, wow. Now, be a dad for a minute. God. And I know we're not supposed to do the gender thing, but you know what? Let's do the gender Let's thing, right? Let's make gender. pretend that we still have testicles <laughs> um, and are proud of it, God damn it. Yes! Um, let's pretend that. Give them a squeeze home. out there. there. Ah! <laughs> um, what would happen... If the son or daughter that you knew was the luminous, like you've got your future and man, and you know that you've poured your love and your life and your, your passion into them. What if they died and it was kind of the asshole pain in the ass kid. Fredo. Yeah. That stayed. Wow. Now ask yourself precisely what humanity do I appeal to? When I come up with the story of, hey, we should be concerned about seven generations from now, because what's plain in my head is, I don't even want my son, my daughter, to inherit what I have. I hope that I leave them a burning pile of dog shit. Mm -hmm. And I think most people would do well to consider that there may be really deeply hurting humans on the other side of the inhuman decisions that we see playing out. There's a possibility that we, by adding fuel to the hate the, you know, hate the people in control, hate the people in control, I don't think we're helping ourselves. So step one is to stop hating the villains. And that's a tough thing to do because there's a lot of villainy going on, right? Yeah. There's a bunch of there's a bunch of pretty nefarious actors out there. No doubt. And and so it's easy to fall into the trap. And we can so justify, we can go. God damn it, I'm showing up. Why can't they? Like, we can get into the trap of projecting our morality, projecting our values onto somebody, and determining that they should have the same best interests that we have in mind. But when you don't see that, ask yourself, is there a possibility that there's something motivating that? And do you think pouring more hatred gasoline on that fire is going to help? And my view is very simple. I want to understand them. I want to respect the journey that they're on, but what I don't want to do is I don't want to add fuel to a fire, which I myself am not sure I could handle, Mm -hmm. right? If I had lost a child that I loved and then I had an asshole left, I don't know what my experience would be, but I know that I'd love to know somebody gave a shit about it. Yes. And I know right now that good people with the best of intentions are pouring hatred onto people who are hurting. And I don't think that's helping us. So step one is a check in with yourself. Can you get to a place where you can judge the action, the artifact, but not take it the next step of going, let's go ahead and malign the person or let's go ahead and malign the anonymity of the, we know there must be controllers and we know there must be dark forces. Well, we, there are. And if we fuel that dark force, we're part of the problem. So that's my step one. Step two is to actually realize that if you don't want to see what unfolds next, then you have to start acting now. You have to start changing your consumption patterns. You have to start, and that means what you put in your mind. That means what you put in your body. That means all of the stuff that we take in. We need to change those patterns. 
If it comes as a headline or a Twitter feed, ignore it. If it doesn't have depth to it, there's a high probability you're being served propaganda. So I got a great idea. Read seven paragraphs, 20 paragraphs, or God forbid, a book. Like read into things, deeply know, slow yourself down to the speed of consciousness, know how to consume. Because it turns out as you know how to consume, you will pick up the nuance. You'll pick up those things that are blinding us with the speed of Twitter feed. Mm. And that depth of knowledge and accountability for what we consume is deeply part of what will ultimately transform the outcome. Because it turns out everything that's being done is actually being documented. Everything I put in indoctrination with Mickey, those are all documented things. That's not Dave going out you know, on an investigative journal. Right, right. That's actually just... Writing a blog I, about it. I read the source documents, right? Yeah. We can do these things. And then what happens next is exactly what, you know, you guys, holy crap. You know, when you and Peyton said, hey, Dave and Kim are coming down, you actually don't know who you we are, but you know by inference who we are. Right. You know by association who we are. You, you light up your network and go, hey... Who's this Dave and Kim that are coming down, right? And you listen to Kyle's podcast and you, you know, you you pick up mm. some data. We need to start letting our community be our intelligence. And I think that is so mission critical right now. Because I'm not going to have time to say, well, if I am vulnerable with Cal, is he going to use that against me? Is it, you know, because we could never have this conversation. Ever. But if I know that Mickey can pull me aside and say, you're going to be in Austin, and one way or another, you're going to sit down with Cal because Cal's spirit and your spirit line up. I don't have to ask you whether I need to verify that because I know that Mickey already, through our work together, has confirmed that I know if he says, trust me on this one, I'm not going, eh, maybe. I'm going, I'll dial it in. And that way, you and I can have a conversation that we could not have if we weren't authentic in community, right? It's not good enough to go, oh, man, I know he's got a bunch of good podcasts. No, I need to know whether I talk, when I talk about the mountaintop, when I talk about Antarctica, when I talk about my personal experience, when I talk about those mm. things, I'm not sitting there going, oh, edit that because you never know what Cal might do with it. Yeah. I don't give a shit. Yeah. And I don't give a shit because I already gave my shits with Mickey. Yeah. Right? And and we got to do that. We do. And I think that's so important. And that's one of the things I've been trying to reach out to some of my friends that aren't here in Austin. They aren't yeah. in the community. And they're wanting to know or they're curious, just like anybody else, what's going on. And so yeah. when Mickey sends me something, when Dell sends me something, when I find something that's really good, I, I pass it along because I don't have time to go fact checking all this yep, stuff yep but these guys have teams of researchers they do the research themselves or so i know when it gets to me right it's as good as gold yep and so i'll pass that along and it's yeah. like if you don't want this anymore that's okay yeah but i'm just letting you know this is what i'm receiving and i've got other things that i'm doing that it's not it's not my orientation to go deep into these rabbit holes yeah but i love having the information it's that trust yep in the Mickeys, the Dells, and now you, where I just know there's, yeah, that's it. It's that trust. But but how cool would it be for us to model a relationship where that doesn't come at a cost, mm -hmm. right? Where the benefit is what people actually start experiencing. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about exactly what's happening right now in this very moment, be entirely present. And in this moment, what we know is that but for a series of trusted connections, Mickey would have never seen my YouTube videos. He was pinged with those for a while and was ignoring them. Mm. But then a couple people with whom I went deep after the global financial crisis said, really pay attention. So this is a relationship that goes back to people like Sean Stone when we did the, the interview years ago on, on the monetary system. And when Sean also said, hey, Mickey, pay attention, then Mickey's going, oh, hold on a minute. That's a, that's a light lighting up on the dashboard, right? And so he connects. And then his connection goes into his own due diligence and all that kind of stuff. And then that 
lights up on your dashboard. And before long, you know, we see these things happen. We have to realize that this is an invitation to a new conversation about humanity because you and I may have the ability to articulate messages. We may have the ability to reach out with language that can access a lot of people's hearts and minds and everything else, but that may be our gift. There may be other people who are really good at sensing and researching and doing all these other things. And if we can't start evidencing the quality of a community where this is not about trust me, trust me, trust me, and then you get screwed. This is about trust me because I am your sensory agent for X. I'm your sensory agent for Y. And I stop seeing myself as Dave Martin, and I see myself as the sum of the community that is that community of trust that pulls it all together. Part of that organism. That's exactly right. Beautiful. I had a question. Yeah. Any regrets... For not taking that position even for a little while, just to get kind of get on the inside. And I'd, I'd be so curious of like what, what, I mean, whatever they were wanting you to do. You know, it's funny. Uh, this is a maybe freaking, regrets. Re- regrets no, no, not the no, right no, word. No, I don't want to use it's, regret, it's, but it's actually, it's actually a funny question because it goes into this really cool metaphysical answer. Um, I talk about alchemy a lot. And in the workshops Kim and I do, I teach people alchemy, which is a lot of fun. Because, you know, when most people hear that, they go, oh, you can't do it. And you can. And the cool thing is everybody can. And I, can, I show people how they can do it, which is a lot of fun. But, but there's, a, there's a... I thought you were just a patents guy. Yeah, just a guy <laughs> going after Fauci. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but this, there's something really fascinating. Evil uses three alchemy processes. Always. And, and the, my favorite analogy of this is Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. The first thing is you take something in nature and you say, set it apart. In the case of Jesus and the devil, it was take the stones and make him bread. Now that's alchemy, right? Mm. Take a thing, make it something else. And a lot of people fall for the sucker punch. If they actually figure out that they can take their time and train it for money, they'll do it. Most of us stop at the first alchemy. Ooh. Right, they take their life force and trade it off, which is kind of a shit trade. But most people do it. Yes. If that doesn't work, evil de- does the next thing, which is it actually takes you to the top of the temple and it says, "Throw yourself off and count on the angels to catch you." Well, what's that? Well, that's the alchemy of technology. Remember what the devil was saying to Jesus was, you know, do something that will harm you, but rely on the technology. These happen to be angels to save you. And, and evil always does that, you know, just all you have to do is, is give up your, your shoulder and we'll give you the technology that'll keep you from getting the thing that we manufactured for you to get. Right. Ooh. Okay. So there's, there's the second alchemy. And the third one, if that doesn't work is I'm going to deprive you of a thing. So bow down and worship me on the top of a mountain. Mm-hmm. And I'll give you the kingdoms of the world. Well, that's the vaccine passport, isn't oh, it? Oh, it is. Right? Evil Fucking always does that. Day. Always does that. And it always relies on those three axes of alchemy. And there's a big metaphysical reason why it works. And it works every single time. Mm-hmm. Turns out light workers don't use the same alchemy, and that's why we fail. I got used to saying no to step one when I was very young Mm -hmm. and I could sniff it out a billion miles away. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cause it turns out when I was very young, I did some things where the trade was offered many, many times. Just be us. Just take the stone, make it bread. And the minute I hear that, the minute I hear that I go, I know who you are. Yes. I know who you are. And, and I know what's going to come next. Now I'm going to tell you, in 1998, what was going to come next is people knew that I was not really in a great relationship. You know what they traded on? That. Just think of the girls you could have. Just think of the women that you could have. Just think of that, right? Well, what's that? Take the despondency I had in a relationship that wasn't fulfilling, and we'll give you the technology Ugh. of the women you want. Okay? And that was an explicit offer in the trade. <laughs> now, the cool thing is, there's, there is a woman that I want, All right? I have, a, I have a Pygmalion problem. I have this archetypal, like if you, get, if I was any good at sculpting, which I'm not, so don't, like, don't wait for this one. <laughs> but, but like if I was going to carve the perfect marble of the perfect woman, 
I've got it in my head. And it turns out that I'm now sleeping with it in my bed. Mm, seems a little softer than that marble. Yeah, a lot softer <laughs> than the marble. But but it's true. And so it's funny how how they thought that that was the transaction. Now, that does not mean that I don't think there are other glorious, beautiful, wonderful women, but I know that I had a picture in my head of what the woman was. And I know that I was offered multiple expressions of women, which is perfectly fine. And many of them, by the way, lovely. And some of them, dear friends, like it's awesome, but they weren't, they weren't that woman for me. And then the best one of all, give you the world. Mm. And that's where they made a mistake. And that's the funny thing. Cause I already had it. Mm. I already mm. had it. Mm. And you can't give me something I already have. Cause I realized when I was that young, brash, arrogant guy, we talked about at the beginning of the show, I realized I could walk into any country. I realized I had insights, perspectives, things they valued, business models that they would appreciate. I, I knew I could go anywhere and have the effect that I had. And the funny thing is they thought I could be more effective. And I sat across the table one particular day at Gramercy Park Hotel in New York. And I listened to them rattle off the places that I could go and the places I could influence. And I just let them go. And then I said, that's like half of my Rolodex. <laughs> and you just go, that's what you got? Like, that's your big offer? Like your Big, big swinging dicks of these 12, <laughs> seriously? And I'm like, and, and the funniest thing about this is, is there's a real deep wisdom in this. Evil is idiotic. It's pathetic. It is so predictable. It appeals to exactly the same three alchemical ordinance every time. And you can get to a place where you can see it and you can laugh it off. And you can go, are you shitting me? Is that all you've got? And I've said to people, and this offends people who think, well, oh, be careful of it. You know, the secret, the wish your future bullshit. Sometimes I've, I've, I've just challenged evil to, to surprise me. And you know what? It never has. Mm. It never, ever, ever has. Because it turns out it uses the same tricks all the time. Now, what we need to do as people who give a shit about the future, who, who actually want to manifest a better future, is we have to stop judging it and start listening and learning. Because if it works for darkness, it could work for light. But it means we have to be smart because we have to invert each one of those alchemies. What does that mean? Yeah, what does Well, that mean? hey, it means we got to start taking the bread and making it stones. We've got to solve the paradox of we have spent hundreds of thousands of years allegedly looking for gold on this planet. You know what? It's time that we start putting the gold back to the planet. We need to start reinvesting in this place we call home. Now, no mindfuck preacher in any Southern Baptist Bible thumping place is going to tell you that, but that's good news. That's the gospel. When we decide to invert the alchemy of evil, can we invest back into the stones? Can we invest back into the earth? Can we invest back into the soil? Can we invest back into things? Right? Take the devil's own words and just flip them. Can we actually get the angels, right, to rebuild the temples, not to throw us off? Right? Can we bring technology in service to community, not the other way around? Right? Take the same devil's trade and just flip it. And then can we actually say we already have the kingdoms of the world? But can we get to a place where the kingdoms of the world are the way we enrich our identity, not give it up? Mm. See, the funny thing is, as simple as I just painted that picture, it's been staring at us in the face for 2,000 years, and we have failed to understand that the devil gave us the roadmap to the light. Mm -hmm. What I love about it is step out of judgment for a minute. I just step out of judgment and say, if something's working, learn from it. You know, don't replicate it. 
I don't want to freaking, you know, have the stones to bread, you know, temple to angel wings, you know, crazy <laughs> shit. I don't want that. Mm. But we do have within us that light. Mm. And that light tells us that we were told that story not because it's just some sort of cute little Sunday school five-page, you know, pictograph. We were given that story because there's wisdom in that story. And if we slow down and understand what that story is about, we start winning. And I'm ready to start putting points on the board. Mm -hmm. And you were, well, you were talking about the other night, we need to slow things down because there, there is, it's, it's, it's a bit of a race against time, which brings me to 2030. Yeah. And when it is alleged that we're going to own nothing. Yeah. And we're going to be happy. And, and be happy. Right. Yeah. So can you talk about the Great Reset? I, I, unfortunately, I don't think enough people know about this. And the first time I heard about it, I told you this before we got on, was when you were discussing it uh, on our friend Kyle Kingsbury's podcast. Yeah. And it fucking blew me away. I literally was waiting to pick my daughter up for, for dance. And I heard that. And I, and I Googled Canada Great Reset. And I was like... Holy shit! What's going on? Yeah, like this is real. Not that yeah. I didn't trust you, but I was like, I had to see it with my. Oh own no, eyes. no! I mean, it's 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 very very real. And once again, we have an opportunity, and this is once again a little history lesson. But we have to go back and see that the illusion of property, which we've all heralded as one of the great organizing principles of how democracies work or how whatever else works, it turns out that that illusion has been an illusion for a long time. I mean, the fact of the matter is. You've got a beautiful place here. You've got a beautiful, you know, setting, everything else. And if you decided that you wanted to put a factory out back, they wouldn't let you, right? So you own this, but you don't really own it. You you own the easement to the use of it for certain approved things. Mm. And and people have forgotten this. They, they've bought hook, line, and sinker. Oh, own property, own your house, own this, own that. No, you don't. You are a necessary part of a fractional reserve capital origination scheme. <laughs> where and and by the way that's a very offensive politically correct way of saying you're a slave but that's what you okay, are fair, fair. Um, you know the the whole point is the the illusion that we are somehow uh seduced into this illusion of private property is bullshit because most of us actually are in fact indentured to a bank for some length of time many times 30 years many times we refinance and we extend it to 45 years or whatever we do but the fact of the matter is we're part of a cog in a system, and the illusion of property has been an illusion for a very long time, certainly since the 1940s. 1933 was when we actually stepped into this illusion officially. So when people say you'll have nothing and be happy, there's there's an element of truth, and that's why these things work. There's an element of truth in it, which is we're going to let you know that the fraud was a fraud a long time ago, and it turns out that you we're just going to tell you it was a fraud, and you were defrauded, so welcome to hell. Yeah. Um, so there's a degree to which they're already starting to tell a truth that has always been true. They're just unraveling the lie version of it. Mm. But so there's an interesting piece of this, which is we actually know that during the New Deal, we had all the social programs, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and in corporations, pension programs. In the 1970s, the ERISA program, which set in motion the, the legislation that ultimately gave us all our 401ks and all this other shit. What happened through all of that is we created an illusion that we would work for 25 or 30 years, maybe 40 years, and we would be paying into this system, and then the system would somehow take care of us. And that was a lie. It was a lie when it started. It's a lie now because it turns out that it worked as long as we were manufacturing, as long as we were trading, as long as our GDP was growing through industrial output. But when we decoupled the gold standard in 71, when we decided to start outsourcing all of our manufacturing, where by 1986, the Office of Trade Policy made it a policy to actually transfer technology and manufacturing to China so that we actually had an antidote to Russians and in influence into China. So that's why we did it, right? We started forcing companies to actually set up their companies in China, incentivizing the offshoring of our industry. And we started celebrating the fact that we were birthing a knowledge economy. That's the bullshit story that was the cover story. This mm. is knowledge economy, knowledge economy. In fact, if you go back and look at Forbes and if you go back and look at Inc. and all of the kind of the mm. business rags that people were, you know, psyched about in the late 90s, mm -hmm. 
everybody said, well, we don't have to worry about the fact we're not manufacturing because we're the ones that are coming up with the good ideas. But here's the problem in 1971 that nobody talked about, which is when Nixon opened up the debt purchasing for China, he also opened up our universities to export PhDs to the same countries that were buying our debt. And it turns out that by the 1990s, we were getting more PhDs from ch in China, in India, in Taiwan, and in Korea than we were getting PhDs domestic here in the United States. Now, that sounds like it's not a big problem, except it is a huge problem, because who were the Indians coming over here? Computer programming, software engineering, the, the people who figured out how to make the things on the chip work. People from Taiwan and Korea were coming over and figuring out how to make the chips that went on the things that would actually be the things that Indians would program that would do. But the Chinese were very interesting because they sent people over for basic sciences. Now, that's a dangerous proposition because what's basic sciences? They're the ones that get to come up with the new things that make things work, right? So we started training PhDs in chemistry and physics and biology and biomedical engineering and all the kind of really fundamental stuff. And that was dangerous because now we actually have trained our competition. And by the way, go to any major, and I mean major like physics, chemistry, biology, any major journal, and try to find the English name. No shit. It's just very rarely there. Yeah. And, and so here's the thing. We're in a situation where we could play this game because we created the illusion that we kept the machine going, right? The music kept going, the... Everybody still had a seat to sit in. Everybody had a seat. So we keep this, this bullshit story going. And then the music stopped. And here's when it stopped. And here's the weirdest part about this conversation. It's already over. It stopped in 2011. When, when we started taking interest rates at, at, at Fed and Treasury rates, when we decided to drop those below the actuarial limits, mm -hmm. and by actuarial limits, people aren't familiar with that, but that's the, that's the minimum rate that we have to have in fixed income so that we can keep compounding interest. And people are familiar with the idea of compounding interest, but very few people understand that there's a rate below which you cannot catch back up. Right? Because you needed to maintain that two, two and a half, three percent kind oh, of range. Shit, yeah. Well, the minute you, in interest of supporting housing or supporting banking or supporting whatever the fill in the blank political nonsense was, we started seeing rates drop to one point eight, and then one point seven, and then one point five, then one point two, then point eight. Every time those rates went down, and you were told. This is a great time to go refinance your mortgage because yes. rates are coming down. No, it wasn't because what that was doing was a shortening the horizon to which the Great Reset had to happen. 2011 was the last year we could have corrected this course. How would they have corrected it? Well, to take rates back up and deal with the consequence. That's right. But it slowed the economy, but that's okay because it would have saved the economy too because what they did was they actually dropped the rates and then they kept them down. That means that every one of the long-dated assets, and people, I'm just going to unpack long-dated so you know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to people who have life insurance policies, which is most people. I'm talking to people who have mortgage insurance. I'm talking to people who have mortgages. I'm talking to people who have 401ks. I'm talking to people who have pensions. And I'm talking to people who think that they have Social Security somewhere in the future. Have I missed anybody? <laughs> I think you covered it. <laughs> All of those people that I just mentioned are all screwed. Because in 2030 to 2031, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, pensions, life insurance, long-dated assets in your retirement programs go to zero because we started borrowing against them at a rate that was higher than the fixed income rate that was going lower. And it turns out the bills come due. Mm. Now, the response that has happened in the past, and I'm not prognosticating this response, I'm just saying, here's what we've done in the past. In the past, the only way out of this, since the formation of America in the 1780s, is to go to war. We have not solved this ever in peacetime. Yeah, what, what is it about <clears throat> war that... It starts turns... manufacturing again. Yeah. Because you have to manufacture guns and bullets and all that kind of stuff. But here's a tiny problem this time. I was going to say the war would be much different this there time. There you go. And that's a real big problem. Because 
the old model that says that a world war kicks into, you know, the economy, this massive industrial spend, which is tanks and guns and planes and all that kind of stuff. The tiny little problem we have now is that we are now facing a situation where the war could very easily be take down the power grid. It could be a low altitude nuke where we have an EMP and it takes out electronics, right? The war that we used to use to get out of these problems involved 10, 15, 20 million guys carrying shit over into, you know, Europe or whatever else. And we manufactured a lot of stuff for them. We, we you know, Hershey, Hershey Foods, right? The Hershey candy bar. Hershey is a name none of us would know but for meals ready to eat for soldiers, right? These things are things that we used to have based on the campaigns we used to run on the battles we used to fight. But now we have the teensy tiny problem. And the problem we have is we have got an existential threat because the war of the future is likely going to be fought over our grid. It's likely going to be fought over biologics, chemicals, a bunch of other things. And it's not going to be the war that actually kickstarts an economy. So the question really is cool. We are over the edge of the cliff. And to use the Wiley Coyote example, right? It's beautiful last like, night. Yeah. We're, we, <laughs> we, we have run off the cliff. We did in 2011. And our wheels are spinning. So we're still looking like we're running. But there's going to be a look down day. And we all know what comes after that. Mm. And now the challenge for all of us. But the reason why I get so stoked about conversations like this is we're having it before the event, which means that we can light up an alternative narrative now. If we wait for the look down moment, if we wait for the moment that we stop running our feet that fast, then it turns out we can't stitch a parachute together fast enough. But we can because we have right now nine to 10 years to solve this problem. I can guarantee you nobody that's elected right now in Congress and certainly nobody in the White House and nobody in the administration is willing to have the honest conversation with the American people that says, let's strap in together for a little bit of a ride. Let's take a little bit of medicine right now, which is actually going to bring some pain and some hardship and some discomfort right now, we could get out of this now. But if we wait till 2028, 2029, by the way, if we get to the 2028 political cycle, you know, just buy a sailboat. Well, it's like, it, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's like the fever is starting to come on and they keep putting, keep giving you Tylenol. It's yeah. Like let the fever. That's exactly right. And just cleanse. That's exactly right. And take your fucking lumps. Yep. Just like, you know, this thing, you know, this virus that happened, it, maybe it's not a popular opinion, but they're like, some people have, have to die. People yeah. die all people the time. Do. People do. And it's like, we, we, we fucking locked everything down to protect, you know, the ones that were already compromised. Yeah. We, and, just, and, and listen, I mean, the numbers, we, we all know this, the, the numbers have been nothing but fear porn to keep things going. There's, yeah. there's no substance in them. There never has been. There never will be. They still have not even gotten close to the numbers that Oxford tried to throw out there to make us all go, ah, the world's coming to an end. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact of the matter is we, we need to come to terms with a very clear reality. There are a bunch of people who are on slow motion suicides because of lifestyle choices. And right. I know I'm not supposed to say that, but that's right. what it is. If you actually let food or lifestyle or beverages that you drink or the failure to exercise or whatever, if you let those things actually become metastatic in your life, and it comes it's a slow of the motion mind. suicide. That's yes. what it is. And so if you've chosen not to live or if you've chosen to let somebody else define for you what living is, you've already made your choice. Now, I'm not saying that you can't change your mind, but you're not going to alter course by somehow doing your part on a propaganda campaign called public health. All right. I, I want to I wanna close with a couple of things. Yeah. I want to go back to your childhood. I would love to, for you to speak about remote viewing. Yeah. 
I also want to talk about the the Death Star analogy. It was fascinating to me. It's yeah. such a beautiful reminder of how to change systems. Yeah. Um, and then I want to finish with the work that you and Kim do. Yeah, perfect. So, uh, so let's unpack the kid thing. I, I never knew what I did. Um, ah, and it's funny because you, you didn't know otherwise because I didn't know that that's just what you weren't that's supposed to do it. Yeah. So, <laughs> yes. um, you know, I, I think it's funny <laughs> because, um, you know, certainly in the late 1960s, early 1970s, the Stanford Research Institute started looking for these kind of unusual talents. And so a lot of us are familiar with the term remote viewing. Um, for those who but, aren't. Yeah, but for those who aren't, what it basically was, was seeing if you can get people with special abilities to either perceive or to sense or to do something. See if there's something we can do to actually amplify that capability or at least harness that capability. And so an enormous amount of work was done with psychedelics and other pharmaceutical and chemical interventions to see if you could stimulate an awareness, not unlike what we see in communities of persistence and in indigenous lands around the world where people have access to spirit, have access to nature, have access to, you know, transport, whatever that is. The idea was there's probably some ways to do that. So a group of people at Stanford put together the SRI, and it was really trying to find um, people with particular nuanced abilities or ways in which that could be generalized. So there was kind of a bunch of things going on. At a very early age, I was identified as a person who had unusual talents. And while the term remote viewing is something that people are familiar with, I actually don't use that term because what I do, what I now know I do, is I would actually um, call what I do presence tuning. And that's my word. That's my term. What I do is I actually tune into the frequency of the person, of the place, of the thing, of the information, of the whatever else, just like you do with a radio dial. You know, when you tune into 1077 on a radio, you didn't erase 89.9, ah. right? You just tuned into it. Yeah. And, and then when you were sick and tired of hearing about traffic in, you know, D.C., you turned to 1035 and you got the top 40. You didn't get rid of traffic on 1077 and you didn't get rid of NPR on 88.9. What happened was you just moved the dial. That's what I have done as long as I've been alive. I don't know, and that's part of the problem. When you've done something, you know, explain to me how breathing works. Well, I breathe. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, that's what I do. I tune into frequencies. And so I'm unusual in my abilities to tune into frequencies. And, and the part that creeps people out is, is it doesn't have to be a particular language and it doesn't have to be a particular time or a particular place. Come on. So it's, it's so I, cool. I got a radio that's kind of got a bunch of extra... Ends. It's, 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 like, like, it's, it's, like, it's like we're going from FM to satellite. Yeah, exactly. And and yeah, and that's the best analogy I can give because when people go, how do you do it? I was like, I don't know. How, how do you not do it? Like, I don't know how you don't do yeah, it. Yeah, what's wrong with you, dude? <laughs> <laughs> Get your shit um, together. But but what that meant was that I um I had I had what was accused in certain communities as a, a very active imagination because I would talk about seeing things or experiencing things or doing things. And people go like, oh, you can't do that. And I was like, well, I just did. Um, so that involved, um, you know, things like knowing about people's death before it was publicly announced. Or in the case of my own life, a very dear friend's murder as it was happening. Like those kinds of things. Now, to do that, unfortunately, and, and, and unfortunately, I have the other part of the problem, which is I also can't really turn off the part of my brain that does that when does it so kick in does it kick it in randomly kicks in, no, well, it just is on like right now like during this like podcast, i would be very aware happen? i would be very aware of things right now happening in colombia i don't know why there's something about colombia right now and there's something really huge about india right now and if i stop talking i'd actually i'll be all the way in there but but it's a it's a thing and the cool thing about it is it's weird how, how I've parlayed that into a, a, an amazing business and career, right? Because I can find stuff 
information. Like people sit there going, how did you know that, you know, Gottfried Liebens in the 17th century was doing this with math? And I was like, well, um, listen to him. Oh my God, um, dude. And, and so go, you go know, on. Pe- people, people always read my blogs and go, how did you find that reference? Here's what happens. I actually have the reference. Then I have to go find the way that you could verify that that reference existed. I backfill oh, every one of my stories because shit. every time I find it, people go, how did you find that? Well, I found it, and now I have to find the breadcrumb trail to let you find that I found it because I always start with what I know to be true, and then I find the evidence trail that will get you to the same piece of information. People sit there and they go, <laughs> how can you memorize like patent numbers? And how can you, like Anthony yeah. Fauci, 1999, the collaboration with Ralph Barrick, like how, how, bleh, how did you find that? Well, it turns out that their frequency is sending out a signal. Now, what I'm describing, by the way, physics actually fully embraces, right? Matter and energy cannot be created or destroyed. They, they, simply, they simply exist and they, they go through, you know, their phases and states, whatever. Every thought, every action, every word, everything that has ever been done, spoken, acted, anything on this planet is in a persistent energy state. And like a radio dial, all you do is you tune into it. So when Starbucks was trying to screw the country of Ethiopia out of the price of coffee and people go, well, um, well, we probably can't do anything. I'm like, uh, actually, you can because there's a preemption clause in the World Trade Organization Agreement. The preemption clause means that a king's decree actually can preempt the thing in the World Trade Organization Agreement. So let's find the preemption of a sovereign decree from King Selassie of Egypt, which actually made Harar Chefe and Yerga Chefe a permanent stamp tax for the country of Ethiopia and Starbucks lawyers are sitting there going, fuck, how did that happen? Well, it happened because the king, you know, a couple hundred years ago just said, our coffee is our coffee. Now, did he do it to know that one day Starbucks was going to come along and be a jerk? I don't know. And it doesn't matter, but... When all of the NGOs had given up and been bought out and sold out to Starbucks, you're looking at the prick no. who said, hey, guess what? Somebody's got to stand up to Ethiopia and somebody's got to give them the ability to actually not roll over to Starbucks and demand their own rights. And it turns out that we pulled it off. Those kinds of things are things where, what is that? Is it viewing? It doesn't, nah, it, God, it doesn't it, feel no. like it just feels like tuning into the energy yeah right when when the prince of Liechtenstein, i can't make this shit up it's this fucked up (laughs) when the (laughs) prince of Liechtenstein filed patents on basmati rice to try to suppress the exports of india okay funded in part by a company here in texas texmati rice which is a texas arkansas company um you know, when, when the Prince of Liechtenstein decided to file patents on Bosmer and so it's only been around 3,000 years. So, yeah, sure, patent it. Why not? Because it's not been known about for fucking forever. <laughs> but they get the patents, and they start messing up India's ability to export rice. Well, guess what? Everybody said, that shouldn't happen, and then everybody caved. Well, everybody except one prick who oh, said, sh- guess what we can do? We can start messing up those patents. How do we mess up the patents? We find evidence that the popping coefficient that they put on the burst frequency of how the kernel of basmati rice opens up at a particular boiling point, which is blah, 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 blah. I didn't know anything about freaking basmati rice. You know what I now know? Way the fuck too much about basmati (laughs) rice. But but that's because you tune into the frequency of going, okay, what, Prince of Liechtenstein, Texmati, blah, 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 blah. All of this, you know, and I did it with, you know, EpiPen, right? EpiPen, the price is going to $40,000 a dose. Well, that feels like a bad thing. So let's tune into that and let's figure out how to make sure that the company that's doing that gets publicly shamed. And I write an op-ed that goes on to CNBC and I get the price of EpiPen crushed back down to where it ought to be. Guess what? This kind of shit is what all of us have the ability to do. And when I talked at the beginning of this podcast about how much I'm in the business of reactivating Mm -hmm. that capacity that each one of us has to just get off this bullshit radio dial where we've been told, oh, you get, you know, top 40 and you get, you know, NPR and you've got CNN. That's all you got. Well, no, you can swap out that radio 
and you can get back to your radio and you can get back into your ability to tune into frequencies. So that's what at 54, I described the crazy ass shit I was doing at five and six and seven and eight and nine and 10. So it's kind of weird. Okay. First of all, <laughs> I for, for personally want to thank you for, for the EpiPen work because Peyton and, you know, our oldest son, Jake, has always had an EpiPen. And yeah. when that shit was happening, you've got to be fucking kidding. We're looking for another resource. Yep. And so she's going to be well tickled to know. Te- check out CNBC, you know, as much as they hate me for my ongoing vigilance of I'm not going to stop talking about any story, even though they don't want me to talk about the coronavirus story. You know, they're screwed because the same guy who actually busted that story open is the same guy who's busting the coronavirus story and doing it the same way. So it yes. worked then and I was kind of celebrated and still working and yes. they're kind of not overly thrilled about it. Yes. Okay. So stuff it. That's the world. I want to I want to touch on within within this framework here. I do want to talk about Iran Contra. Yeah. And how that what your work was there and um when like how was it found like who was the first one that believed you that you were actually doing something other than just being this like weird kid? Oh, uh, we we had we had a um principal at our elementary school in Southern California, Citrus Elementary School. We had a principal. I don't know that you know this, but there was one guy who won the Korean War. Did no. you know that one guy no. who, who won it? Well, here's the funniest part about that. We lost the Korean War. So, <laughs> but, but our principal was a vet who was pretty sure he won the Korean War. <laughs> and, and, and he's the guy who put me into a bunch of special programs. So that, that, was, that was how I got into the special programs wow. program. So, okay. Yeah. Good so for him. The guy that won the Korean War. There we go. He's got two <laughs> things on his mantle now. Yeah, I think he's probably shoved off this orb a while ago, but it, it was pretty funny. All right, and tell us about... But he was, he was pretty stoked about it. Tell, um, us, tell us about Ollie North. Well, so I, I happened to be uh, responding to a fairly interesting situation in Costa Rica during the Nicaraguan War because there's a bunch of refugees coming across the border. Um, you know, there was a shortage of people who were actually helping kind of be air traffic control to figure out what to do with that that crowd. So I was asked to go up to Guanacaste to be part of a response, you know, handling refugees coming across the border. And as I'm want to do, because it's just in my blood, (laughs) I kind of start poking around and I start going to interesting places. And I was intrigued by the fact that the central intelligence agency, the drug enforcement agency kind of had a bunch of staff that hung out in the general jungle area that I was in and started interacting fairly frequently. And, and we were allegedly, you know, Nancy Reagan was just saying no, and Ronald Reagan was saying war on drugs and blah, 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 blah. And, and there were a couple of very well-known drug lords that, that, you know, were allegedly, you know, outwitting the entire intelligence apparatus of the United States government, <laughs> and they were hiding, and we had a bunch of people down there looking for them, and blah, 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 blah. blah. That was a cover story. I remember, I, I remember sitting in my Jeep one day, um, listening to testimony in Congress about how U.S. presence wasn't in southern Nicaragua and northern Costa Rica, and mm. and I had to turn up my radio because C one thirties with U.S. flags were flying at about five hundred feet overhead, flying into the old Samosa land holding that had the air airstrip that you know we were running drugs and money in and out of and paying for the Iran Contra problem with, you know, gun running and drug running courtesy of the United States government while we were having a war on drugs. Now, what I didn't realize is the war on drugs was we were on drugs and we were having a war. So technically the (laughs) label was right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, I'd say, I'd say, you know, we probably, we probably back in the Second World War had a war on smokes. Um, in Vietnam, we probably had a war on pot. And, yes. you know, in Central America, we had a war on coke. And we were coked out and having a war on it. Um, but, you know, I should bump J.P. Sears out of this Austin scene because I'm Buddy, fucking that, funny. Dude, you just dropped right, that, was that one. That was beautiful. Yes. Like, I, I pulled that one out. Yes. Um, but... So what we what what was happening was they were keeping on mentioning names, um, and they kept mentioning names of, and I kept hearing one particular name, a guy that actually um, is is very influential in the black ops funding of U.S. operations for, for 
many decades now. And um, so I kept hearing this name of a guy. And, and I do what I do, which is I start doing research on, okay, what's this guy about? And it turns out he's got property in Texas and Arkansas, and he's doing a bunch of other weird shit. And there's a bunch of stuff that is going across the Atlantic into Turkey and then getting into Iran through Turkey, and it's getting into Iran directly through Iran. And, you know, and so what's happening is I'm starting to compile all this stuff. And, and the danger of what you're experiencing right now for me is once I tune into a thing, I, I don't forget it. Ooh. And that is not necessarily a good thing. Sure. Because the Senate Armed Services Committee and other members of Congress who I first interacted with in 1983, which you can do the math on, I was 16, um, my first interaction with the Armed Services Committee, um, knew about some unusual things that, you know, I might be able to they do and so forth. Seriously. So they actually um, took my ass seriously. And, and a couple members of the committee um, actually went to bat for a guy who said, you know, there's something wrong and we ought to look at it. No now, the cool thing is, and, and, and I will say this, I, I'm, I have worked for presidents on both sides of the party line. I've worked for, you know, congressional and Senate folks on both, part, both sides of the line governors, you know, you name it. I, I have tried to stay in a space where I can be of service when I need to be of service so that nobody has the, oh, he's the approved, sanctioned Democrat or Republican or whatever else. Yeah. And I've kept it that way my whole life, which is really good. But what I, what I will say is that people like Senator Sam Nunn, um, phenomenal guy. Um, somebody like um, Chuck Grassley in Iowa, you know, people who... Ideologically, I might not agree with, a, you know, some or a lot of what they stand for, but but at the heart and soul of it, you know, when Chuck Grassley looked across the table from me and said, you're talking about a massive fraud. And are you telling me that it's really happening? And I go, yeah, it's really happening. That was enough. Like he stood up for the right thing. Mm. And I've had encountered that, you know, I've encountered that several times. Now, I would love to say it's most of the time. It isn't, but there were people, I mean, Howard Coble, you know, really good people, Bob Goodlatte, there, there were people who were elected officials who ideologically, many times we have very deep disagreements on maybe social issues or values or whatever else, but I respect the fact that when they were presented with information that was very contrarian and unpopular, um, you know, Chuck Robb when we did the Rob Silverman Commission hearings on the intelligence failures in Iraq. You know, I keep to this day a beautiful handwritten note from him thanking me for being the who I am. Mm. So so I do have people. That's so good to hear, by the yeah, way, because I think I do politicians, by and large, get in, in. I'm guilty of it, just like in, it's all of fucking racket and they're all paid yeah. off and so yeah. it's, i appreciate hearing that so no and i you. do that because I, I i think we we make a mistake when we kind of throw the baby out Which with you were talking water. about earlier there, there's like there's, can we take the the judgment yeah, out there's there's uh, i mean god i can give you the list on the other side of assholes that yeah. you know have have even kind of brought me in just to punch me down like that you know there's a world of those too. So I'm not saying that, you know, I have some sort of divining rod and I've got the lucky ones. Yeah. Um, no, most of them are shits, but, yeah. but, but there, <laughs> yeah, but let's keep it real. But, but there are yeah. really good people and people who understand that, that there's a time when you have to do the hard decision, right? Chuck Grassley didn't win any points when he and I worked together on, on busting a bunch of the corporate tax frauds. You, you, you know, you, you don't win, you know, Tax collectors are as popular today as they were in Jesus' time. You know, it's not a thing to do to get Christmas cards and like buttons on your Facebook. No, you're you're popular f amongst the, the the common man, but not amongst yeah. the people who are who are going to be yeah. throwing you dollars. Yeah. So, I I honor those people. I mean, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have probably invited sixteen year old me to the first hearing on selective service at sixteen. And so what, what did you but, do in that particular, you're, oh, you're 16. Yeah. Wow. Oh, it was cool that night though. Dude, check this out. Cause this is an amazing thing. <laughs> I did the whole thing on the hill. They, they had me at a beautiful place right across from the white house. It was freaking amazing. 
And um, back then, the FBI building and the Black Panthers headquarters were a couple blocks away. So I had heard about that, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to go. You know, I always wanted to see the J. Edgar Hoover building, so I wanted to go there, and then I wanted to walk back to my hotel. But I decided, hey, why not walk past the Black Panthers headquarters on the way back? So I want a mental picture of this in your head. I had, are you ready for this, white parachute pants. God. And baby, they were freaking spotless white. They were white, oh. white, white, you know. The way you dress right? is not a doubt in my yeah. mind that they were they sparkling. Were they were sparkling. <laughs> they were white. I had a light lavender shirt with white. Are you ready for this? White collar and white cufflinks, oh, man. French cuff. Dude. Rocking it. And then I had a black and iridescent blue narrow skinny tie. <laughs> <laughs> the tie. <laughs> Skinny. You're welcome. You You're were welcome. So in too. So Skinny was, I was so dope nailing back then. it. Right, 1983, and I'm walking from the J. Edgar Hoover building. I'm walking past the Black Panthers headquarters, and it became abundantly clear that I was not going to have a lot of people looking like me on that street. And what do I do? I just keep going, and this guy comes up and goes, "Yo," and I said, "Hello." This is like 10 o'clock at night, and <laughs> and he goes, yeah, "Cool threads." So I was Cool Threads. I didn't know what Cool Threads were because sure. I had not heard Cool Threads before. So, but I figured that's a good start. I mean, I was, yes. I was looking dope and there we go. Oh my God. And we had the greatest conversation because they're like, what are you doing on this street? And I was like, walking back to my hotel. What's your hotel? I'm going to this place. Whoa, that's, you know. And, and we had this amazing conversation. So what I loved about my life, and it's always been that way. Right. I mean, from that day to when I negotiated with Chris Uma in Papua New Guinea mm. on the Bougainville Civil War, like I've always just walked into I'm just going to show up with what I am. Right. And, and just be who I am. And whether it was Black Panthers in 1983, whether it was, you know, uh, Bougainville Resistance Army and in the 2000s, you know, the fact is you just show up, you be you. And it turns out that genuine recognizes genuine. Yes. It does. Yes. And it doesn't matter whether genuine Ooh. is, you know, genuine warlord or genuine, you know, whatever. I don't know. I don't know who I got to talk to that night at the Black Panthers, but I know that I got genuine and they were real people and they really listened and they were like, what the hell is a 16 year old kid from Pennsylvania doing, you know, in DC talking about, you know, the rights of of young people with respect to the government and government service and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I had a real conversation and I was about as white a guy and, and I had white pants on. So I just amped it you, up. You like did. I was, that like, was an amplification that was, for that sure. Was, that was privilege. Yes, you know, that yes. was white privilege because yes. my pants were really shiny. <laughs> yes. um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's always about, just freaking knowing that real is real, genuine is genuine, authentic is authentic, and anything that isn't, it's not a gray scale, right? No, real is, and then everything else isn't. You know, and I don't, I don't want to uh, toot horns here, but I think that's what you're talking about too with with people like Mickey and, and yeah. our relationship, you yeah. and I now, and it's like we're we're just showing up in a different way, and we yeah. can tell when. Someone isn't because I yeah. know when I haven't been. Yeah, and when I'm not, I I don't know who's showing up. Yeah, because I'm so out of my own. Yeah, you know, out of my own way. But before we go on to the Death Star, yeah. I'm glad Death you're, Star's great. I'm I'm glad you brought up uh, Papua New Guinea because I would love just to if you could share that story and you shared it with me last night. But really, um, it really gets to the heart of just all the work we are kind of always doing yeah. and how the, it's not good or bad. It's just these different kind of orientations to it. So yeah. if you wouldn't mind, so indulge me. It's funny. You know, I found a country that's my age, literally my age, right? Oh, Papua shit. New Guinea is as old as me. Um, and, and a lot of people don't know, but you know, Papua New Guinea was given to Australia for the inconvenience of its administration which is one of the most bullshit decisions that the UN ever made in the universe, where they just said, oh, we'll just give you a country because it was so damn inconvenient for the 800 people that were on the island during the Second World War. We're going to give it to you as, as your compensation for winning the war, which is bullshit. 
but but the independence of Papua New Guinea and my birth happened about the same time, so it's a country as old as me. And one of the weirdest things about that country is there was, at the time, known to be one of the world's largest copper reserves on an island called Bougainville, which is kind of at the end of the Solomon Islands. If you actually look at a map, it's more Solomon Islands than Papua New Guinea, but Australia knew it and decided to draw it into the nation, the independent state of Papua New Guinea. But then they did <laughs> something. Convenient. They did something which was a real dick move. Um, the Australian government, under the Queensland law, decided to make Bougainville Copper Limited a company that was extra constitutional. In other words, they decided that a corporation could exist outside of the laws of the country in which it operated. And so quite literally, they wrote the Mining Act and they wrote the Constitution to essentially afford them the ability to steal the largest resource of the country in perpetuity. One of the few things where you just sit there going, and the UN, by the way, supervised it, sanctioned it, whole nine Mm. yards. This was full on, just how do you keep a a country from ever emerging? You brought and, the UN too, and that just struck. Yeah, a well, do, do we have time for to just to drop there, a little a bunch little of knowledge dicks, on them? Okay, <laughs> yeah. Um, but and, and the UN as an institution, what a freaking cover up! It's just absolute bullshit. But we're but this is the evidence of it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so what they did was they they wrote into the law a thing called the Bougainville Copper Limited, which is a company that was exclusively licensed to take all the copper out of out of Bougainville. Just so shitty. Second largest copper reserve in the world. Um, and, and it's not like kind of a nice copper reserve. It's shit-ass good copper. It's like amazing. The water comes out iridescent blue. It, it, it You know, literally water coming out of the rock is filled with copper. It's like back up a suction hose and pull copper right out of the ground. Um, and the reason is because it sits on top of a volcanism spot, you know, and it, it basically leaks out metals in their nearly pure state. So it's freaking amazing. But anyhow, um, Australia decides to start mining the copper in Bougainville for, for decades is, is robbing the country. And what they're doing is actually one of the most nefarious things possible, which is not only did they set up a bullshit racket that allowed them to sell copper that should have belonged to the country, but worse than that, they never declared their gold sales because it turns out there's a shitload of gold there too. And they were flying that in and flying that out and they were shipping it in and shipping it out, never paying royalties, taxes, anything else. They were just freaking robbing the country blind, all sanctioned by the Australian government, all fully supported by the Australian government. There was not a single bit of this that the Australian government did not know was happening. They were explicitly complicit in this thing. The UN knew it was happening. And the people of Papua New Guinea, are you ready for this? Got pissed. Oh, Can you imagine that? Like, holy <laughs> the shit, nerve! Like, damn them. <laughs> <laughs> so privileged. So this, yeah, it's black privilege, you know. <laughs> it's Melanesian privilege, whatever. They were pissed. And, and so... Um, uh, Different parts of the area of Bougainville, you know, were aligned with different families and different tribes and different communities. And different ones of them were getting more of the benefit or less of the benefit based on where they were. And so in 1988, 1989, Rio Tinto had had then moved in as the corporate operator, still Bougainville Copper Limited. But they had moved in as operator and they decided it was time to suppress worker revolts around the you know copper mine the misappropriation of resources the the imbalance of the benefits that were not flowing back to the country but going into the pockets of a few people and at the time they decided to fly in a bunch of mercenaries and kill people gunships strafing communities that have been there for 40,000 years oh shit 20,000 people half the island's population killed and none of us have heard about that And that is the good part, because then it gets worse. What gets worse is that the people who survived the Civil War, which is the convenient name to call what it is, I mean, it really was a mercenary genocide. And by the way, I use the word genocide because the corporation was actually found guilty of genocide only to have the genocide finding dismissed for lack of proper jurisdiction. Right, so, and that's in a U.S. court, by the way. A U.S. court found that Rio Tinto 
was in fact guilty of genocide, but the case was brought in the wrong jurisdiction, so they got away with it. Talk about justice failing. There you go, 20,000 people's lives. But but it was good for shareholder value. Um, <clears throat> so So what happened after that is from 1989 forward, there's a place called Morgan Junction. It was kind of the DMZ. It, you, no one goes there, nobody goes there, and the Bougainville Resistance Army had their resources there. And, and so there have been all kinds of UN efforts to go in and negotiate peace, blah, blah, blah. And so these erudite, bullshit, you know, conflict mediation UN people would come in and give everybody a blue shirt and a blue hat, Mm. And they'd walk behind a banner going, we should resolve the conflict in Bougainville, and they'd fly out. And then they'd go back and lie to the public saying, well, there's just unreasonable people in Bougainville that aren't willing to negotiate the disarmament of Bougainville, blah. Which was all a crock of shit. It was, it was UN maintaining the instability so that Bougainville, Copper, and Rio Tinto maintained their ability right. to manipulate resources. And by the way, along the way, steal $198 million of royalty funds that they actually retained from the people and kept on their balance sheet and kept trading for the entire period of time from 1989 until when, you know, we finally got this thing blown up in 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. But what's fascinating about this story is after tons and tons of people decided this is a failed state, failed re resolution, nobody's going to get there, yours truly is asked, hey, would you go talk to Chris Uma? Now I didn't know who Chris Uma was. He's, you know, this is a guy. ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, had gone down to Morgan Junction. They'd filmed a grainy, you know, this is warlords, this is people with guns, be afraid kind of bullshit. And, and so the whole of Australia knew that there's a terrible place to go. I'm getting out of the Land Cruiser when I get there. I flew into Buka, drove in the Land Cruiser down, and on the way out, they go, um, you know, White people haven't been able to come out of here alive. Like, just even a few weeks ago, somebody went and got killed. So so I was getting out of the car. And <clears throat> and I walk up to Chris, and, and you know, and he's got all of his guys with all of their automatic weapons. You saw the picture. It's a beautiful yes. picture. And they're, like, you know, legit, like, heavies there. Yes. <laughs> you know, he, yes. he, he's ripped, and, and he's got all of his guys. And I walk up to him. I reach out my hand to say to just shake his hand to say hello. And then all of a sudden I'm like, I'm walking up to him and it's like, I've worked with so many people across the kind of race relations barrier. I, was, I would never have this kind of handshake reaching out to him and doing kind of the white guy corporate boardroom yeah. handshake. I'd give a high five and a shoulder bump. So I go in high five shoulder bump into Chris Uma, warlord Chris Uma. And everybody's guns go, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that shit don't go down in this neighborhood. Yes. And, and um, then Chris like melts into this smile. He starts laughing. I start laughing. The guys around him start laughing. The guns go down. And 45 minutes later, I've gone through the whole anatomy of what I just described. This is how you got screwed. This is how it happened. These are the people responsible. And here's this guy who's been literally, I mean, he has been killing people, right? He's, he's a warlord. But he knew that there was an injustice going on, just, but he didn't know what it was. And the frustration, the rage, the anger of that oh. just fueled this conflict. And the minute you could actually give him the honor and the integrity of going, you're a bright guy. I'm a bright guy. What we're going to do is we're going to sit down and talk about how this happened. And I'm going to teach you enough about the capital markets and how fraud gets done and all that kind of shit. So you actually stop having the... I'm just angry, but I don't know why. Oh, yeah. I'm going to give you the information, which is, this is why you should be angry. This is why I'm angry. This is why we can meet in that anger, but do something different. And 45 minutes later, we had our agreement to move forward. And for the first time, actually talk about the end of the conflict that had started in 1989. Now, the cool thing is he's sitting there going, how are anybody going to believe that I did this? Because he's most wanted, he's evil, whatever, whatever, whatever. I said, well, here's the deal. I'm flying from here to Europe in a couple of days. And if I get out of here alive, that'll be kind of win number one. <laughs> and he's like, for both of us, that'll be good. <laughs> and, and, and I said, but here's the thing. I said, and I don't remember what it was, but I remember when I was a kid, there was an album and it, on the album jacket cover or on a poster or something, I remember an M16 with a flower in the gun barrel and, and a helmet sitting next to it. I can't for the life of me remember 
who it was, but I'm pretty sure it was a record album. It might have been Beatles or somebody like that. I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go down to Morgan Junction, the same place that the Australian Broadcasting Corporation did this bullshit, grainy warlord video, and I'm going to shoot a video. And by the way, this is on YouTube. Anybody who wants to go check it out, you can check it out. And where, I, do, where do they search? Uh, uh, probably Dave Martin, Bougainville or Morgan Junction or something like that. Okay. But it's on my Dave Martin channel. We'll have it in the show notes. But um, so I grab my 35 millimeter camera. I, I film myself walking to Morgan Junction and I freaking replicated the ABC bullshit footage. Oh, like, shit. This is me, and I'm going in this dangerous place, blah, 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 blah. and the whole time, like full color, brilliant, <laughs> beautiful, everything else. And then I pan across, and there's Chris Uma, you know, and all of his guys at the at the at the boom gate, which is the boom gate to Morgan Junction. And they open it, and I walk through, and I talk about be scared, be afraid of these people, and they're all laughing and smiling, and we're having a great time. And then we took their guns and we put hibiscus flowers in all the gun barrels. I'll send you the copy of the image so you can actually see this. It's yes. so fucking beautiful. I took the picture and I said to Chris, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to uh, The Hague a couple days from now. And I said, I'm going to show him this picture. And I'm going to tell him that this is not a war crime. This was corporate theft. This was corporate genocide. And I'm going to carry that message for you. And it was funny because as we were leaving, he goes, well, what am I going to do? And I said, you know what? You have defended this place for the last 20 plus years. And you've kept people like me out of it. And you've kept everybody else out of it. That's pretty legit. So I said, why don't we do this? Every time I come here, why don't I hire you to be my bodyguard? <laughs> yeah, <fuck laughs> and, and he just laughed and he goes, well, okay. But could we start with, could you just get me a cell phone? And I said, yeah, I'll get you a cell phone. And then he wanted to make sure that I had his number programmed in and my number programmed no in. Shit. So I actually have Chris Uma's speed dial. No shit. In case I ever need a warlord to cover my ass. Yes. Like how many people can do that? I don't have that. Yeah, most people don't. <laughs> and, you know, so it's just it, it's just an amazing thing. But that that picture for me embodies everything, right? Because that picture is... The, the, the thing that harms humanity, the thing that robs us of our ability to live together is ignorance arbitrage. Somebody has information. Somebody decides that it's not in your interest to have that information, and they made that decision for you. And then you build resentment in communities. You build resentment between people. You build resentment in relationships. And then we wonder why things go off the rails. You want to solve the world's problems, freaking solve that. If you have the information, share it. If you have that perspective, share it. If you have the ability to make a difference, make that difference and make sure that you don't hold something back. Because if you do, whatever that little advantage you have, whatever you think is in it for you, is a metastatic cancer cell that's going to infect everything that comes next. And it's time for all of us to live a cleaner, authentic integrity filled way of going i'm not going to make a judgment on whether you're ready for this information i'm going to give it to you because i know that we the people can only rise if we all have an equivalent access to the information around which we can make decisions beautiful mm. all right death star me death star <laughs> yes so there's an old cult one of the smallest shortest lived so in this giant zone of loser religions <laughs> this one probably only made it a couple centuries, so <laughs> don't sign up for it. Um, but there's a thing called the Archimedean cult. And the Archimedean cult, as it sounds like it is, is a bunch of people that thought Archimedes was a badass and decided to make kind of a religion out of him. And inside of a lot of their work and a lot of their documents, what they have is this obsession with a thing called the Archimedean solid. And the principle of it is very simple. That... We're all familiar with the Archimedes picture that seems like Archimedes was Dutch in the 17th century. Like he's got pants on and he's got a balloony, blousey shirt on. And I don't he's know got if everyone's on. familiar, but I like, but, I'm glad but, that you're painting the you picture. You kind of got the picture. Yeah. And then, then he's standing on a cloud and he's got, you know, a, a fulcrum, a large beam. And then at the other end is the earth. And underneath of it, an old English script is said, you know, give me a lever and a place to stand. I can move the earth, which is a very famous Archimedean mm -hmm. quote, right? So we obsess about levers, leverage 
leverage, advantage. You know, how do I get leverage? How do I do that? How do I do that? Well, Archimedes was actually obsessing about fulcrums because it turns out that a little move of the fulcrum does a shitload more than getting bigger or better levers. Most people don't even think about that, Mm. but just the tiniest little movement of fulcrum changes everything. Move a lever, eh, doesn't much do anything. So, Mm. but the funny thing about the cult was they were obsessed about the solid. And, And that's an interesting thing because the Archimedean solid principle was about the radius of the solid. They obsessed about the radius of the solid. And I kept thinking about, okay, what's, what's going on there? And then it hit me one day. Oh, when I was a kid playing with a top, you spin a top. And it's just sitting there doing its thing. And then all of a sudden, you know, it starts to do that little wobble. And then it gets bigger wobble and a bigger wobble. And, and if you're like me, you try to see if you can get it to straighten up. And it doesn't. It falls over. Because processions of tops ends with the top falls over. Well, it turns out that the Archimedean cult knew this. And what they knew was that the most effective place that you can have a fulcrum is actually one degree off the center of mass of the inertial mass of a solid that's in motion. So if you actually had something spinning and you actually wanted to change it, the way you would change it is to get to the middle of it and then introduce a wobble. Because if you introduce a wobble, the system does all the work. It takes all, yeah. Right? Rather than being in the frictional outside of things where you get burned up, chewed up, destroyed, everything else, one degree wobble does a hell of a lot more than the world of friction which is kind of cool. So that's the Archimedean principle. But I I bring that home to people in the Star Wars analogy of, if you look at the Death Star, right? Outside the Death Star, you got all these X-wing fighters and all kinds of weird shit flying around. They all have lasers and they're zipping around. They're going way too fast. They're, you know, (laughs) your son is driving them. You're like, holy shit. (laughs) Ah! So that's all happening on the outside and, and it's a very dangerous place. And as you get closer to the skin of the Death Star, they've got gun turrets and laser turrets and, kind of all kinds of other weird shit flying around. And so you got flying things and zipping things, and then you got the gun turrets, and they're all doing their thing. And and so that's a terrible place to be. And then you get into the hangar, right, the first layer of the Death Star, and that's where Darth Vader and all the stormtroopers and all the crazy-ass people that look like kind of Gestapo kind of dudes, they're all hanging out, like, in the bays and in the in the office wings and all the cool shit first layer Death Star. They're all top-floor kind of guys. And you might get a stormtrooper or two, like one layer down. And then you get to the middle of the Death Star, the reactor core of the Death Star, and it turns out nobody's guarding it. Nobody. It's a giant cavernous empty thing. It happens to be the only thing that's important because it's how the whole Death Star actually works. And nobody's there. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of, huh, that's interesting. Right now, when you think about it, that means that the incumbent energies of the universe actually think that they don't have to guard what powers them. Oof. They actually don't. Yeah. Because they know that we'll all be sucked in by the bullshit of what's happening on the surface. And we'll be going, oh, I don't want to be around the flying things, and I don't want to be around the gun turrets, and I don't want to be around the stormtroopers. So, so by intimidation, by the illusion of this frictional exterior, they think that there's nothing that can happen on the inside. Well, it turns out I've decided that I'm reactivating the Archimedean cult. Mm. It only ran for 200 years, so why not pump it a little more juice, right? (laughs) Yes. Let's drop in. (laughs) Let's look at systems. Let's understand systems. Let's find their center of mass and then get intimate and close into those systems. Don't judge them. Don't take them on. Just get inside. And then slip into the reactor core and just go, I'm going to just introduce a wobble. And then get the hell out. Now, the funny thing is, you remember this from a top, right? You didn't see the wobble start. But you knew when the wobble had started, you knew what was going to happen. Yes. Right? So the way I approach life and the way I approach challenges and the way I approach everything I do is to say, honor and respect the thing, even if it's the thing that you perceive to be your enemy. Mm. Enter an intimate relationship with it. Get on the inside, understand how it works, understand what the layers are, understand all of the things that motivate it, understand the human factors. You know, are there lost sons and daughters? Are there emotional traumas? What are the things that are are those superficial things that are animating the energy? Because once you've done that, 
You know what happens? They invite you into the reactor core. Mm-hmm. Weirdest shit possible. Wow. They actually open yeah. the door. And then you go into the reactor core, and you don't blow it up. You just go like that. And you just let it just take that little course. Wobble. And then what happens is you're out for months, years. They still go, yeah, we really like Dave. He's done amazing things. This has been amazing. And then people start going, does anybody have some Dramamine? I feel like a, <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and the cool thing <laughs> is, you know what's going to happen next because yeah. you actually set in motion not something which was nefarious and dishonored the energy. You actually honored the energy fully. Mm-hmm. And you said, you're there, you do the work. I think we all need to enter into a space where we can actually suspend our judgment and get discernment instead. Because if we do, we'll realize that all the energy we've ever needed is always there. It's always there. We always can drop into it. And if we actually refine the martial art of discernment, we can always figure out how to get to flow in the direction we want it. Mm. Mm. My Death Star. <laughs> yes. All right. Wrap up with um, the work that you and Kim do. Yeah. So Kim and I are, as you know, um, we are trying to live an authentic relationship. And for that, um, we have to work every single day. Mm-hmm. Um, it turns out we come from two very different worlds. I come from a world that was heavily influenced by religion, um, by science, by all kinds of other things. So I have a, I know this is going to come as a shock, but I'm a kind of a linguistic guy. Like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no one would have guessed. I'm more of a picture feeling guy. No. Um, so that's my, that's my, that's what I bring to the table. She brings a very aesthetic, um, very intuitive, very um, image oriented. I mean, she's very, very aesthetic in terms of how she approaches her world. And so we have some very explicit, easy to find kind of sucker punch ways that we can actually harm each other because I can sit there and go, why aren't you saying what you need to say? And she's going, why can't you just feel this? And I'm like, because I don't feel it, right? Yeah. So we have that kind of stuff going on. So we have our own journey. And the thing that actually I was doing when we met was the workshops that I do. Um, I teach people a process called integral accounting. We actually take people through this six-dimensional lens of analyzing everything. Largely is a trick to just slow your mind down, but it happens to work too because it's, um, it's the lattice on which the alchemy of evil and the alchemy of good actually get woven. So the cool thing is you're learning how to slow down and you're learning how to master the martial arts of energy in the universe. Um, and I've been teaching that for a very long time. Turns out that I was doing that on the Antarctic cruise that Kim was on. Mm-hmm. That's how we met. <clears throat> and she saw her way of introducing her energy into taking that kind of theoretical framework and bringing it into human relationships. How do we actually start really analyzing what makes us tick? You know, can we get to that Temple of Apollo, know thyself level of awareness where know thyself was not a motivational poster? It was a warning. Before you enter into the presence of the Almighty, make sure you know who you are, right? That's what that was about. That was about making sure that you purified yourself. There's no difference between the know thyself at the Temple of Apollo as it was the, you know, the high priest who went through purifying rituals before he went to the Holy of Holies. The whole point was clean up your shit before you approach your own divinity because if you don't, you know, get close to the fire, shit's going to burn, right? So... So this is not some sort of, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we knew ourselves? No, it's you're never going to get to that proximity to your divinity if you actually are carrying your shit with you. So how do you get that out of the way? So we started doing a process called fully live. And what we did was we took three very simple principles, magnetism, light, and the breathing, the respiration process. And we said, if it's more complicated than breathing, we're not going to talk about it. That's as hard as it's going to get, Mm. breathing. And so what we do in the workshop is we actually simplify life down to breathing, to magnetism, and to light, the three elements that make life happen. And what we do is we go through a journey where we start by changing our awareness of consciousness. I do a magic show about two hours into the workshop. A literal magic show. That that people sit there going, oh, shit. 
And what I do in that show is I make it very accessible to everybody mm. that everything you think you know hmm. has to be suspended. Because I'm going to give you evidence that every principle since 1640 that we've been taught in science is false. And I mean every one of them. And I just show people not only that it's false, but I then show them how they can show themselves it's false. So they actually go through a process of a kinesthetic learning of doing it too, mm. which is really fun. Because once you know that you've cracked open the possibility that all the stories are false, then everything can be reexamined. Yes. And so we start with a really fun like playground of, oh, shit, that, whoa, that's cool. And we start playing with that. And then, and then we go into a really painful journey. And the painful journey we go into is actually looking at how we've historically seen the world versus how the world's always been seeable. Mm. And that's a really tough one because when you really encounter yourself and all the things that you've decided to take on as victim energy, story energy, whatever else, the minute you actually own that, oh, shit, you mean I had something to do with that? Like, people, I mean, how people get grief, they get sadness, they get emotions, they get a bunch of things because when we encounter our responsibility for our own lived experience, sometimes there's a lot of cold crow to serve up yes. and eat and go, hmm, tastes like crow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it's a tough journey, but, but, but we hold that space and let people drop into the grief and the sadness and the anger and the how the hell did that happen? In one case, a couple workshops ago, we had a woman who was com contemplating suicide. We were doing our workshop in a tower that was seven stories high that had a spiral staircase, six of those seven flights. And at her low point, she decided to go up to the top of the flight of steps. Um, that really happened, right? The, when I talk about these things as an existential pain where people go, oh, shit, I have been responsible for the pain of my life in many instances, there's some real issues that show up. And, and what I did in that particular case, which was fucking awesome, mm. is I said, I want to be an advocate for death. I want you to come down. And what I want to do is I want to actually show you the energy, the transforming energy of death. And I want you to love it because if you're going to choose death, I want you to choose it because it's beautiful. Mm. Whoa. It was the most amazing event. 20 plus people sitting there having me advocate for death to show what it was, to go through the dimensions of all the energies that it involves. Not only did that woman not jump, but she to this day is going around helping people taking that same message and going, I'm going to show you the beauty of what you're contemplating. And in so doing, I'm also going to remind you of the choices that you're making, which are going to take that experience. And you're just going to do a trade. You're going to say, okay, I'm, this is what I'm choosing. And it's going to come at this cost. And by bringing that into a slow motion where I'm not trying to save you at all, I'm, I'm actually trying to give you a picture of going, Hey, you know what? Every decision we make, we ultimately are the architects of that energy flow. That's what it is. Coolest thing in the world. And it's amazing to encounter that. But it's a low point. And then the third and fourth day, what we do is we bring people out through the process of breathing. We use the model of how carbon is built into glucose and photosynthesis and how we respire it in our cell metabolism. But we use that to see if we can tell ourselves the story of who we are, how we came into being. So we actually map the six neutrons of carbon that were present at your inception. And we actually map them very precisely. And we use some old technology. Yeah, you were to do telling that. me this the freaking other night. Amazing. I was like, and we just drop God. into the fact that those six neutrons that are the things that beget the protons, that beget the electrons, that are the carbon that is literally what forms us into our first shape and our first, first expression of lively, life and livelihood. We, we actually map those six things so that we find out what is the, let's call it very simple kind of metaphors. What's the chip that's running your system? Oh. And then we actually ask the question, okay, when we shine light on that chip, what's the operating system? So what's that next layer up? because there's only so much you can do. You have to know what the chip is before you can write the operating system. Ooh. So what's the operating system that is the thing that's playing in your head all the time? What are the energies you're attracting in? What are the people that you keep bumping into going, I can't understand why I keep having these kind of people in my life. Well, hey, guess what? You're attracting them in. 
Let's talk about what that is. Let's understand what that is. That's the operating system. And then what we do is we end with the application layer. We actually put your chip and your OS into the glucose molecule. And we see what happens if you breathe on it. We see what happens if you actually say, okay, let's see if, the, see if we told ourselves the truth. Let's see if we can map every relationship we've ever had using the simple model of the glucose molecule and see if we can figure out whether we're lying to ourselves or telling ourselves the truth. And the amazing thing is, in four days, the commitment I make to everybody is they move into a six-dimensional way of living, which is what we advocate, get into the sixth dimension, live in the sixth dimension, which is amazing, because what it is is always slowing down to the speed of consciousness, making sure every decision, every word, every impulse you have comes out through the speed of consciousness, making sure that that's how you navigate your life. And then take ownership for the fact that you are the steward of energy that incarnated for a purpose. And the minute you lock that in, good or bad, because some of those neutrons are beautiful and some of them are shit. <laughs> right? I got, a, I got some shit neutrons that I came in on. But, but the cool thing is you drop into it and you start going, okay, you know what? I'm going to stop pretending like I can change the app layer or the OS or the chip. Because you know what? That's there. Mm -hmm. But rather than seeing myself as a victim of it, I'm going to start owning my accountability for it. And now I'm going to use it to freaking martial arts the shit out of how I live. Ooh. So the whole thing ends with this kind of jujitsu where the alchemy of life is what you leave with. Where you can seriously look at every situation and go, I know where the energies are. I know where my interventions are. And I know what my outcomes are before I've ever done anything. Well, I, I told you last night, we're going to host one here yeah. in Austin. I cannot <laughs> wait, brother. Yeah, our next one's in April. We're going to have some fun. We got a bunch of people coming from around the country. And, and you host them at your place? We host them at our place. We go to places. I mean, we've done them all over the place. But um, yeah, it's really beautiful. And and I'll tell you what, you know, I, I've done them for, what, a dec two and a half decades. Shit. Um, but but the, the pride I have in the fact that my goal is to never have anybody take the course again. Um, which is kind of funny because it makes the commercial side of this kind of weird. Yeah, but, yeah. But, Interesting but, funnel. But, but it's really cool because what happens is, you know, we're now to a point where, you know, 25 years later, the only people who have sat through multiple courses are people who've decided they want to teach it or, or share it or whatever else. I've got a beautiful woman, Amanda, in, in Australia who I'm working with on building another curriculum that's like a light version of this for kind of corporate audiences and stuff like that. But, but we really pride ourselves on, you know, we, like I said, in lizards eat butterflies, I want it to be the antidote to the self-help addiction. I want to give people something which after you get it, you can't unknow it, which means you don't need me and you don't need a facilitator and you don't need any shit, which is the 12 step program, the blah, 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 bullshit. The universe has already given you everything you need. Yeah. Everything. And all you have to do is tap into it, honor it, wake up every morning with gratitude for it, and you're golden. That's where we're going to close this. I love you, brother. Thanks for being here. It's been so great to like mm, just spend time together. Yeah. And thanks so much for coming on today. You've got it. I can't wait for the next one. We'll yeah. we'll 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 do it at a workshop. We'll come at it live. Yes. We'll process a bunch of this stuff. But man, this is the best time to be alive. We all yeah. chose to be here right now for right now. It's awesome. Awesome. Thanks, brother. You got it. <laughs>